What's going on, goats? Welcome back to Buku Bucks. My name is Ramo, and today we will be going over day two of the ICT speedrun. But before we do get started, let's go over day one notes. All right, so here are my notes for day one. For the very first video, I just simply put, just shows his TD Ameritrade account to show proof of his live trading statements. For the second video, continues to show his statements to be open and honest with not only winning but losing trades. Don't be afraid to take losses or see them. It is okay to take a lot of trades for the sake of overcoming anxiety or just the fear of entering. Takes time and experience to overcome this. You want to try to have controlled days of trading, meaning you are not over trading and allowing your emotions to get the best of you. For the third video, don't be dependent on anyone else. The goal is to make your own money. Begin with low contracts or lot sizes. A lot of profits slash progress can be done with very little. Have the mindset that it is going to take time and experience to become a successful trader. If you are looking for the easy route, quit now. Being a break-even trader is actually good. You aren't losing money. Even small progress is good progress. The psychology with a demo account is different than a live account. Just because you are doing great with demo does not mean you will do great on a live account. When you hit your profit goals, example, monthly profit goal, it is best to stop and not continue trading. If you are feeling negative thoughts or emotions while trading, it is your cue to get out of that trade. For the last video, major psychological barriers. Fear of missing moves, rooted in not understanding what your setup is. Fear of losing, not trusting your plan, slash lower leverage if you are not trusting your plan, and take less trades. Impatience between setups. Forcing trades that are not there. Fear of not being good enough. Stop caring about others' opinions and stop comparing yourself to others. Fear of losing streaks and drawdown. You will lose. Lack of discipline and following rules. Searching for the next best thing. Stick to a winning strategy. Don't continue to switch to find the next best thing. You do not need to be perfect. Effective journaling. Stick to only a few pairs slash markets. Note how you felt going into the trading day. How you feel physically or emotionally can affect how you trade. Record any concerns or fears you had in price action. Note how you felt during or while in that specific trade as well. Contrast your personal expectations versus actual results. Helps identify your weaknesses. Detail where you felt uncertainty and how you coped. Understand if you are attacking the negative emotions properly or causing more problems. Use positive words for those things you did well on. When you go back and read your journals, you do not want to bash yourself. Avoid negatively charged words where you struggled. And take screenshots of price before, during, and after price action. So those are all my notes for day one. And without further ado, Let's go ahead and jump into day two. For day two, we will be attacking all of the core content, the 2016 core content from month one. Okay, folks, welcome to the first teaching tutorial on the monthly mentorship for month of September 2016. This is the first of eight. Each month you'll get eight individual teaching tutorials that will complement the general theme for the month. Uh, this particular teaching is going to be endless, but trade setup. And you probably noticed uh, this month so far, we've been focusing primarily on showing consistency that's able to be delivered to you as a developer after you've submitted the time and you've done the work with the exercises and content uh, materials that we're going to be presenting to you. Um, when we refer to elements to a trade setup, there's really just two primary uh, concerns. And one is obviously context or framework surrounding the idea. In other words, what makes the idea uh, favorable for trade? It's not just simply, well, my manager tells me this or my supporters tell me that. There has to be something that builds a reason to want to do this trade. In my material, we're going towards specific principles and we're dealing with them in general terms and then what we do in those conditions where we specifically pairing up with in terms of the ICT tools. The first one's going to be extension. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about extension, what we look for in that condition. We're going to talk about retracements and what tool or concept we use for retracements. <laughs> Reversal. And lastly, consolidation. Now, each one of these four give a specific framework and a context to the market base that you're going to be trading in. They can only be one of these four conditions. Either the market's going to be expanding, running away, or it's uh, trending, uh, a retracement, or pullback, uh, all together reversal. And obviously, the market's going to nothing. It's consolidating. But we all learned in the market uh, series. So, so far, what he's showing us or telling us is that we all need to have some type of framework or some type of setup that we're looking for that is going to give us context to the idea or the sentiment of what we are trying to do. And so far, he's showing the four phases that the market can be in. It could be an expansion. It could be a retracement reversal or consolidation so i'm assuming he's going to show us what we can expect price to do or what we should be expecting price to do when these four things are happening and the other characteristic we use for defining elements to a trade setup is using these four criteria for context framework specific reference points in institutional workflow the first one is order box 
the second one is fair value debt and liquidity pools, liquidity pools and stock runs, and lastly, equilibrium. Now understanding these two characteristics together will give you a greater understanding. Before I show you how I did 65 to 85 percent of my option trades, let me ask you a question. Understanding of market efficiency paradigm. How the smart money interprets price, and how the influence the general populace or the speculative uninformed money. It's going to be a rather illuminating uh, total, actually. You're going to be able to look at the marketplace with an expectation of knowing what to apply based on what the market providing you right now. It only takes a second to look at the marketplace and determine, okay, what characteristics are we trading? So that way you can build a context or framework on how you're going to approach the marketplace. So I'm going to drive right away an issue where you can say, I'm not going to do anything, it's not I'm going to be waiting. The other three conditions are going to be providing you an opportunity to take action relative to the tools that we couple with those conditions or context. Now, the interbank price delivery algorithm, or what I always refer to as the algo or interbank algo, uh, is the actual, basically, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a price engine that um, when we receive our price for our currencies, it's actually 90% done by electronic um, algorithms. So it's all based now. It used to be a in the pits, uh, but there's no longer an auction market. It's all AI. And it's based on principles I've been teaching for about seven years now. Um, you're not going to learn these things because, number one, no one's going to believe that it exists. Uh, there is this movement away from human involvement with market making. Um, it's become much more efficient to be electronically based, and these things are programmed by human beings, obviously, and there's intelligence are limited. So uh, while that is probably unsettling for some of you are listening to this thing, well, I've had a free market I'll show you again. Uh, it's actually not. It's highly manipulated, especially in the foreign exchange, which is what we're primarily dealing with here, because of the nature of it being so the fingerprints, if you will, are easy to see once you understand the operations and the conditions that the market maker uh, interbank price delivery algorithm functions. So when the market does what it's doing, uh, it gives you indications, it gives you fingerprints or clues as to what you should be expecting next. And that's where your answer to the first question will be coming in. Uh, you're not going to know these things right away for the time watching this video, it may go over your head, but for some of you that have already went through the three processes, I believe, that are in my free tutorial section on my website. If you haven't gone through this micro series, precision concepts, and market series yet, you're going to need those. Okay, so don't be discouraged if you have some time here, and go over your head, because they're all taught in those three tutorial series for free. Look, there's a lot of material, 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 with smart money concepts or ICT concepts, the idea is that the banks are the ones moving the markets and it isn't going to be actual physical people. It is going to be an algorithm that is running the market and ultimately is set up to seek liquidity, build their own orders and move price in the direction that they want. So they are the ones profiting and <clears throat> the retail traders are the ones losing. So I'm sure he'll go more in depth on how we should actually understand that a bit more in detail, but that is just a general idea behind it so far. And algo. Okay, obviously, uh, the market goes sideways or it's consolidation, or whatever it's holding pattern. Now, when this happens, the market will be looking to do an expansion. Okay, so all markets start from consolidation and move into an expansion into an impulse move or an impulse price swing. Uh, after the impulse swing, okay, either it goes back to a consolidation again or it goes to a retracement. When retracement happens, it goes back down into another level of expansion. Or after the expansion, it can go to a reversal pattern. After the reversal pattern, you'll see another retracement, then back to potentially consolidation. These four conditions they interchange throughout the ups and downs and as and flow marketplace. You're only going to get one of these four conditions, and you're probably saying, okay, well, that's a lot. I need to know one of these things to make a trade. No, you just need to know where it's at right now, where it's likely to go, where it came from. And over the course of the month of September, you're going to get a lot of understanding about how to know where the market's going to go next. And that's going to fill in a lot of gaps you have with teaching directional bias ICT. The main thing is the consolidation begins with everything. All moves take place in the market start from a measure of consolidation because that's what the market's building orders. So the market keeps the market in a tight range or defined range until there's enough money on both sides of the uh, upper and lower end of the range that's being defined by consolidation. Whichever one has the highest amount of money to be absorbed, that's the direction it's going to move in. We don't always know that is, but we wait for the expansion. When the expansion occurs, that's when we get the clue as to what the market is most likely to be doing. And we wait for your retracement or no consolidation or reversal. But we always wait for the first expansion that gives us all the insight we need to make decision. Now sometimes it makes it so far we can't do anything but we have to wait for the or the next consolidation. There's nothing wrong with that. It's all normal. You're not going to catch your move. Main thing is to understand these four individual uh, characteristics to a trade setup because price is delivered by one of these four conditions. It can't be any other way. Now what is expansion? Now expansion is when price moves quickly from level e. I'll quickly add how he was describing in consolidation how orders are being built up and like I said we haven't gone through it in detail and I'm sure he will but when price is in consolidation we understand that the banks are basically trying to build up the orders to either go higher or lower we understand that there is liquidity resting on both sides of the market and they're just building up liquidity getting ready to sweep it and take price in the direction that they want and so far he's just showing once again the four phases the market can be in and there's really nothing else that the market can technically do but when price is in consolidation we understand that price is ready to make a move as they are building orders equilibrium now expansion couples directly with the whole of an order block and what is your, the important point of knowing expansion well when price leaves a level quickly this indicates that one of those on market regular intended repricing model and what does that mean well if we're in consolidation okay, or point of equilibrium if price were to move up quickly that would give us an indication of looking for a bullish order block. We don't want to chase price. We're going to wait for price to come back down into the order block. Where is that going to occur? Well, we're going to look for price, the order block, that the market makers leave near or at the equilibrium price point. So I know what you're thinking. Okay, I'm going to close my head. Give me some examples. No problem. I'm going to show you that right now. So you see here, there's a consolidation in a blue shaded area. Very clear defined consolidation. It's got a clear discernible high and low. And the equilibrium price point is directly in the middle of the high and low end of that range. You can simply take a fibonacci tool you have in all your platforms, lay the fibonacci high and low in the general consolidation, find that midpoint, and you can check yourself also by looking at how many times the market touches up against it from below and from above going down into the how many times it's touching and hanging around that level. Eventually, the market will move outside the consolidation. You can see that impulse move in that tan shaded box. It moves away from the equilibrium price point, and then all so here you're showing the consolidation area where price is basically moving sideways. And then we have that big impulsive move to the upside. And he's marking up the equilibrium of the 50% or just the halfway point of the consolidation area. I believe he's saying price tends to <clears throat> come and hit that point, even though technically this wick does not touch it. But as you can see, it gets very close. At the same time, there is a bullish order block resting in this area that price is also mitigating at the same time. The bullish order block. When the price comes back down into that and hits it, that's where we'll be buying. And now you can see it hits that level and expands the upside over 100 pips just by using that simple principle. It repeats itself all the time. It's in price action all the time. And if you study just to the left of the consolidation shaded in blue, it's actually a consolidation uh, in the sell side where the market broke down and came right back to
So to go back real quick, I believe this was the expansion example. Yes. And so he's, I believe what he's speaking about is as price expands away from um, the consolidation area, this is the setup that we are supposedly supposed to look for. And now we're going to go over the next one. Next one is a retracement. Now we're retracement. Retracement of the price moved back inside the recently created price range. Now years ago, after the 2012, I did a webinar called Trading Inside the Range. And a lot of folks that were following me on uh, one of the forums that is pretty popular on the internet, um, they went, every year's when they learned this, this simple principle of understanding how you trade inside the range and it doesn't have to break out of the trend. You can define the range by a high and a low and trade inside the range. And that was the beginning basis point of how I brought a lot of people from that forum into the understanding of the order block. The order block was introduced in the Sniper series tutorial on my website, but uh, prior to that, I had to give them clues about what order block was actually referring to for selling out for one. What's the importance of the retracement? When the price returns inside a recent price range, this indicates the limits on the market because the reprice to level is not efficiently traded for fair value. And when we're thinking retracement, the go-to is for ICT tools to look for liquidity gaps and liquidity voids. When we look for price, when we see run ups real quick and run downs in price, and we'll real quick rise up or real quick rise down in price, many times that range that's created will want to come back in and close that in. And I'll give you an example of that looks right now. This is an example of retracement. As you can see here, the uh, orange shaded area made a real quick sudden movement away from a price level, and that quick sudden movement creates what we call a liquidity void. In other words, as the market drops aggressively like that, uh, there's going to be pockets where the price wasn't actually delivered on every um, uh, you know, available price level in that range. It moved too quickly to create gaps. Well, what we'll do is we'll wait as a trader we want to chase price, we'll wait and say, okay, there's going to be either an indication that it's long. And try to fill in that range, or we can wait for it all the way up to it and fill in the liquidity void. Once it hits it, then it'll probably resume going lower. And that's what we're looking for in terms of liquidity void. So we've covered three conditions. The next one is the reversal. The reversal is when price is going lower. And that's so before we continue here, he's talking about what we should be looking for as a retracement as price is in bearish order flow, bearish structure. Price is just going bearish in the retracement phase as price is going bullish. Obviously, this will be a retracement relative to the bearish downtrend. We should anticipate price to basically fill the liquidity voids or fair value gaps. To be honest, in my trading, I always look at this as just another simple order block mitigation. It's technically up here. This is a bearish engulfing order block as price is mitigating that. But based off what ICT is showing, the order block situation so far is, or when we want to use the order block situation when price is expanding away from consolidation. But if we're looking at a retracement, we should anticipate price to fill the liquidity void. We're looking for in terms of liquidity void. So we covered three conditions. The next one. Is the reversal. The reversal is when price moves the opposite direction. direction taken. So if we are looking for reversals, we're directly coupling that with an ICT tool of liquidity pools. And what's the important is that when the price reverses direction, it indicates the market is a level stops and a significant move should unfold in the new direction. When we look for price, the liquidity pools just above or high and just below or low. Okay, we're looking at examples of reversals here. Every X indicates where it stops with a, and the market goes just above those levels and rejects and goes away, or goes just below those levels and X and rejects and goes away. How many times there's any opportunity to on one chart and it's going to pair out with the trade US versus Swiss? Uh, this pair is real choppy. It tends to have a lot of this type of price action. So it's very favorable if you're into trading like this. Turtle soups and false uh, breaks are really, really good um, in the Swiss. And lastly, we have consolidation. So on this um, one with reversals, we're just trying to see a high or low being swept to give us indication that price is going to reverse. Um, we'll see if later on in the course we can better understand which high or low we should be using to understand if price is going to reverse. Because for example, like this low down here gets swept, but we don't get a huge reversal, right? Um this high gets swept, but we don't have a huge reversal to the downside. So he is showing that when price takes out a lower high, we can probably anticipate a reversal coming from these areas. But I think it's important for us to know, okay, which low or high should we be looking for? So see. Last thing we have. Consolidation, and when we're referring to consolidation, we're directly linked to the equilibrium. But what is consolidation? Consolidation is when price moves inside clear trade range and shows no willingness to move significantly higher or lower. And what's the importance? When price consolidates, it indicates market makers are allowing orders to build on both sides of the market, expecting new expansion near term. And what we look for in price, we're waiting for the impulse move or impulse swing price away from the equilibrium price level. This is now exactly the halfway point of the consolidation range. Now, show you an example of what that looks like. Here's the here, we've identified the range defined specifically by the candles, not the wicks. As you see, price moves out in an expansive manner and then come right back down to the equilibrium price point and then expands to the outside. By having understanding these specific characteristics and elements of trading, the setup, you give yourself a framework to first learn how to practice and study protection and eventually work towards understanding consistent setup uh, discovery. And by utilizing the time with the data, we'll be able to these characteristics and correlate specific elements to trade setup by repetition and by using the daily time with me, where we can outline the elements of the trade setup, we'll be able to do all these things. And matter you will be able to retain it, make it yours, you'll be able to discover what's the trade because one of these characteristics is going to be your bread and butter condition. Some of you will trust the equilibrium, some of you will trust the word block, some of you will look for the void, or the liquidity gaps to trade into. Uh, some of you will have one or two of these characteristics you'll trade within. Uh, those parameters will go for your trades. Some of you will eventually grow into understanding all of them and universal. But don't think you have all of them well known on your belt before you're actually consistent. If you can just find one element, as we start here, if you just find one for you, just for you, one, you can start being consistently profitable in your trade. It only takes one setup, you need to know what context or framework you're going to trade in, couple that with an ICT tool, and you wait for the conditions. You're not going to trade every single day, but you can get a couple every single week. If you can look at four major pairs with one condition criteria, you'll find a trade every single day. But that's not what you're trying to do right now. You're going to grow into that over time. But for now, just go through your charts and try to look at all the examples that you have on the left side of your chart and outline them individually based on characteristics and elements that you've identified here in this teaching. Until next time, wish you good luck and good trading. So with this one in consolidation, I believe what he's saying is we should be looking for trade setups within equilibrium. Equilibrium is going to be the 50% of the range. And when plotting up the range, we should be using the candle bodies, not the wicks. So down here, we can see with this bearish candle, he isn't using the wick low. He's using the closure of the candle or just the body low and up here, the body high or the closure of the bullish candle.
So that was it for day one. We are going, sorry, that was it for the first video of day two. We're going into the second video now. Hey folks, we are in the second teaching of a series of 8 for the month of September 2016. And you've seen this before, that's what I'm going to bring this up to you one more time. Uh, this is the market efficiency paradigm, and what this giant is depicting for a while China community by drawing out is uh, we as new traders are collectively part of this larger whole over here of uninformed money. And whether we acknowledge it or whether we believe it or what, um, we will invariably come in contact with the understanding that there is a smart money group of traders out there. And when I first got involved in trading, I didn't know anything about smart money. Uh, I just knew that market efficiency there, and I could be profitable, and in fact, I was going to be profitable, I knew it, I couldn't believe uh, it was money until I lost it. <laughs> so uh, when we as traders look at the market as new investors, new traders, new speculators, um, we may or may not have the understanding that there is a smart money entity out there. And we as the larger populace of retail money trading, we think because of our sheer vastness, okay, we are the driver okay, of this apparatus that's called marketplace. And we tend to think of ourselves as the drivebacks of what makes the market go down, which is the facade, that's the facade of supply and demand, that's the facade of trend lines driving price when it touches it, that's the facade of moving average call servers causing prices to go up and down, that's the facade that's perpetuated. And we are led to believe that's exactly what takes place, either in books or in seminars or in uh, webinars or gurus, people. And I've done this around here too. In fact, I was convinced that indicators drove price up and down. And I packed houses on America online, and I went on chat room, and people were in there talking here, the things I was discussing about stochastic, and RSI, and we just aren't. And I'm talking about three limited indicators. We need to figure out what's going on with this whole one. So if anyone knows more about being in this group here, trust me, it's me. I've been, I've been in this group enough to know that I learned more about this group here. It doesn't have to itself. But contrast that with everybody retail. We're all sure. We all have my textbooks. We're sharing. We're all trying to be on Instagram, showing everything. Where else? Houses, cars, boats, yachts, girlfriends, anything yours. Everybody is living large over here in the unemployment money. And somebody's quiet. They're just doing their thing. Who's inside this small circle over here? The banks. Who's in here? Everybody on social media. Everybody on retail account. And all the gurus and teachers out there that have things that are selling services. And yes, I have them service, but what I'm teaching you ain't available anywhere else. See this group, this large audience of people. They think, and I'm part of this group initially. They think that the sheer vastness and size of them is much more controlling in terms of where prices are going to be driven higher or lower. Because the buying and selling pressures equate to their mere involvement in price. And that's the side. This huge populace of trading people, or traders, community, and retail realm, is really not that big. But we are, like, we are huge. And we're giving this, this idea of ourselves, we're giants. We push price around. And we don't. We don't. In fact, it's this smaller group of traders. Okay, they're the ones that influence this entire mechanism that we call the markets. This smaller group of traders is actually the drive shaft. And if this is a belt of a car, okay, like an alternator, this is the actual motor spinning the whole price higher or lower. It's not this big circle of people. So that's the paradigm shift. So if you're over here thinking that it's the group of traders that is online talking amongst themselves as a whole, they're the ones that make price go down because they're buying and selling interest. Because the supply and demand factors around them that's what pushes price around. That's the facade. And I'm here to tell you that you need to put that to bed now because I'm going to level everything you've ever imagined about the marketplace and how it really works. You have no idea where we're going. And you need to leave this realm in this circle of people and their thought processes and transition and have a paradigm shift in your thought process about how markets are efficient. Because they're not efficient for the speculators, they're efficient for the smart money. The banks drive price, but you won't accept it or not. That's what's going on. And as soon as you get to that understanding and expectation of what it is that's going on in price, it's not for your well being, it's for the bank's well being. It's their business. They're the liquidity provider. Everyone else is liquidity. Are you a lamb or a lion? Which one? Because one of us is going to eat meat, and the other one is going to stand there and grass. I don't want to be part of this herd. I didn't want to be part of this understood where I was. I want to be out there. I want to live over here in a small area. And for years, I quietly made money doing nothing but focusing on the things that this small group of entity traders did. And I looked at these individuals in the shape with disdain, thinking, I'm going to go Matthew, I'm going to go to the I'm going to do the same thing. And as I looked at more and more and heard stories about people and their lives, losing their homes, marriages, it tugged on me. And I didn't want to just be over here being like the banks. And then I bridged over into what you saw me do in 2010. And I revealed a lot of things. And this mentorship you're doing a whole lot, but it's not meant for you to share on your YouTube channel. It's not meant for you to share on your blog. It's not meant for you to pass around on Twitter, Instagram, make torrents. It's not supposed to be there. It's only supposed to be between you and mine. You're welcome to share this with your, with your children, your family members. It's not a legacy, but don't make this common kind of knowledge. It's not so, so far here, he's explaining the difference between the retail traders and the smart money traders. By this diagram, it looks like as retail traders, we are the ones that hold control of the market because we are just large in numbers. And based on this image, this is what the big circle is trying to represent. The smart money is a small circle and it looks smaller. But in reality, they are the ones that are moving the markets. They are the liquidity providers, and we are just the ones willing or unwilling liquidity. So understanding that the smart money traders, even though they are relatively small, they have a lot of money, a lot of power, and a lot of influence in the markets. We should be trying to trade like them and not trying to follow the herd of retail traders. At the same time, we will always be a retail trader, but the idea is to learn and look at the market as smart money traders, bank traders, and trade similar to them. Some people are going to take this stuff and be the one that, you know, I'm cool guy. I'm the one that got in here with all accessible everyone else. And she can kill you with a hero. You know, you're not really doing yourself a favor. Let this stuff stay well hidden. You're paying for it. Appreciate it for what it is and don't share it. It's not going mainstream. You're, you're just the group you have. Whoever can make it into an October 1st now, that's it. That's it. It's going to be in September. In October, we're buttoning up all of the free store stuff and we're going right into the nuts and bolts we're going to go to to get the live ones. So when we come to the marketplace, we don't understand this. We think that this group that we're part of, we are the, 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 the market. We are the market. We're the trader. We push price up and down. If you're honest with yourself, if you trade at any time, you look back in your trading, you probably looked at the market, you saw something like this. You, you knew something was going on, you just, you just couldn't put it together. You, you see these vague things that take place in the marketplace. You're stopping one. You know exactly what you're doing. You, know you see these things happening to you, you just can't figure it out. You notice something to it. You, you, you have the sensation that, you know, yes, it's rigged. I'm not going to get me. It's not only a broker. It's interesting. Feed that drives price against the funds. And brokers are going to expand the spread as well on you and not you out. When you look at the price action as a new trader, and you have this exposure to understanding how much you're doing to the degree of every single minute detail, they're absolutely controlled. It's an AI. It's artificial intelligence. It's, you are not trading against a person anymore. It's a computer program that delivers price. And it knows human behavior because it's the same way it's been always. Fear and greed. So when you look at price, and you trade along, you had this fuzzy picture about something going on behind the scenes. I never really understand what it was and there's suddenly there's clarity. Suddenly you understand that there's something that's been there all along, now you can identify it. And what's more important is you understand how to track it and do the same thing it does. And by default, you become a resident of that small circle. Because this small circle is the drive shaft. It makes the market go around. It's not the big populace of traders. It's the
and you've been here before. This, this is what I have. You either stay in this long enough to leave this group and come over here, or sit back and go here. You get real close to the end, you get down to this group. You get real close to the end, you get over here, and you start the level more, and you start the level more. Some of you in my group right now, and this pressure, you're in this little area here. But you can see there's some signals and signs of a really empty slot on your play, but you're not feeling really meant to leave this group yet. You have too many convictions about your tools, your indicators, your, your pet guru, your buddy that has a website that's so cool to you. It's just not enough. You gotta be able to release all that stuff and just leave all behind and join the smart line. Because trust me, we're not so cookies, but it's a way better lifestyle over here than it is over there. Yeah, so I could definitely relate to that. Just um, trying to, when I first started trading smart money concepts, you definitely do have to clear your mind and get rid of all the old concepts or teachings that you have learned um, because it can really hinder your thought process, especially if you've never learned smart money concepts or even don't even really understand the idea behind it. So I recommend what he said, take away all the old preconceived notions, all the other ideas that you have in mind, clear your mind and try to learn smart money concepts as a brand new student, brand new trader, and work your way up from there. So I give you two characters to it. There's not a thing around the trade, and obviously they're back to and it's too short of flow. So you have to do a bridge to two, understand and apply into respect to the world box, that gas, liquid coins, liquid cools, stop on, I'm sorry, stop, runs and equilibrium. What does that mean for us, for instance, so of price? How can we use these ideas and make it applicable to price? Now, in this video, I'm talking about the long-term trade that you can't be trading. But there with us, as you go through these I'm give you immediate feedback, and way you get that is by using intraday study, because you get a lot of feedback and intraday action that is applicable to longer-term charts. But you can't, I can't teach long-term day trading unless I long-term trading on day chart inside of 12 months adequately. It can't be done. You should only be done in a circle one year. But with intraday, it's like compressing years of data in just 30 years. What's it? I think it's a good trade. Turn Suddenly, expansion, retracement, reversal, consolidation means something. Every day starts consolidation, gauge range. After midnight, there's a negotiation that takes place. That's expansion. It's telling you what you're doing. What's it doing? It's making the high low in London. That's what it's doing. For reversal, that's what it stops. Then there is another expansion move. Okay, down into the, the New York session. Then there's what? Another consolidation. That's the New York consolidation going into the 8 at 8:30. News embargo left, where there's another injection of liquidity for a reversal. Then there'll be another expansion, and then going to Monday close, which is another reversal condition. And then what happens? Market consolidation for the rest of the day. So we have a way of looking at these things and applying these concepts to time of day, and we can get rid of this. Let's get back to the interbank the The range structure can be really broken down and simplified, but it starts with a quasi broken. That's I won't. I won't break this down too much because I'm sure you will. But what he's showing is usually during Asia, prices in a range creating the consolidation. And then there during London, there is a reversal. Usually that happens after the Judah swing. Usually the Judah swing takes out some form of buy side or sell side liquidity. Then you get the reversal for London. And then there's some type of retracement for price to continue to move in that London swing direction for um, New York to continue in that specific direction. But like I said, just a quick little rundown of it, but I'm sure he'll break it down more in detail soon. Liquidity for a reversal. Then there'll be another expansion. And then we're going to close, which is another reversal condition. And then what happens? Market's for the rest of the day. So we have a way of looking at these things and applying these concepts to time of day and routine characteristics. Let's get back to the interbank price algorithm. The daily range structure can be really broken down and simplified, but it starts with a price equilibrium. That's age range. Then there's another innovation. And that's always going to come by way of some news event, some news driver, either at the time of the innovation or just before. That's the juice one. Then we'll see a range expansion. Then we'll get the high reverse one, the range will start expanding. It'll break down into 5 o'clock in the morning, New York time. Four, go up into that time of the daily direction. We're going to use the perspective as a buy day. That means that Asia, the Asia range has a long solution in the midnight New York time. It'll drop down price. That's the innovation. Making the false move for the world. There's a range expansion. Then it goes into the reversal. That's the classic London open scenario. Where it shoots down, runs the stops, and then what happens? It expands again. There's another range expansion into what? 5 o'clock in the morning, New York time. Between 5 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning in that time window, the market will go back into consolidation. Then it'll have a retracement between 8 o'clock and 8 o'clock in the morning, New York time. Then it'll have either a reversal in New York session or another expansion move. The range will expand the rest of the day. Going up into 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning, New York time. Where it will have a reversal again. That's long close. Then the market will go into consolidation and intraday at 1900. Going across LTDs, uh, platform, if you follow along, 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 Nothing can happen until consolidation. Consolidation is the market. Why? Why is that important? Because that's the order of building up the marketplace. The market is a lot of order of building up the range. The next stage is always expansion. It's not consolidation to retracement. It can't be chased out of the thing. It's not consolidation to reversal. It's not consolidation to reversal. So when you see a consolidation or a pattern, you've got to say the next stage is going to be impulse liquidity. It's going to be more impulse. Impulse price swing. It's movement. You can see movement. By determining what that movement is in the direction as well as the conditions you're trading in, once we're in the expansion stage, okay, then you have a choice. It can retrace, come back to the order box, just behind, and then recapitalize, and then make another leg up or down relative to the direction it's moved. Or once it's moved in expansion, it can reverse. Once it reverses, okay, there'll be another expansion, then it goes back to consolidation. The main thing I want you to understand is it never goes consolidation retracement. It never goes consolidation reversal. It's always consolidation expansion. Then from expansion, it goes to retracement or reversal. It does not do consolidation, expansion, consolidation. That does not happen. It does it. consolidation, expansion, you retrace another uh, movement to orbit and recapitalize and do the same direction movement in expansion, or it goes from expansion to reversal. When you understand this algorithm, the way it moves and the way it operates, it's very generic, it's very systematic, it has only a few options to go to. And the so to try to simplify this one, I believe what he is saying, once price is in consolidation, it'll turn into an expansion phase. Once it is here, it will either turn into a retracement or reversal phase. And then once that is done, it'll go back to expansion and then back to consolidation it'll never go from consolidation to retracement consolidation to reversal it'll always go from consolidation into an expansion and then from there it will do one of the two retracement or reversal and then once it does that it won't go straight to consolidation you'll have some form of an expansion to then go back to consolidation 
all these things are putting together and we'll know exactly how I'm doing these things internally. And I'm doing it on the fly. I'm not measuring things, I'm writing this down, I'm writing down the I just know I look at Christ, where I should be seeing. Can you see? I'm thinking all the videos and I'm doing my sessions with you. All in that you're better understanding Christ's literally. And when you understand these things, when you get to the, the level of month eight and month nine in the membership, you're going to be so strong at knowing what the next things are happening in your place that you're studying. You'll know all these four things, okay? There's only certain processes that have to take place in a certain order. Like I said, it never consolidation reversal. It never consolidation retracement. It goes consolidation to expansion move. It's either going to trace back down into where it's going to go right up from, or it's going to go right up into where it's going to drop down from. The consolidation stops all. They're going to run an expansion, then once it expands, it's going to come back and retrace and you're going to go right up or down, or it's going to reverse. And from the reversal, track line time. The general structure is consolidation in Asia, expansion, reverse in London, makes a higher level today, then expand. Small consolidation in New York, retracing to 8 o'clock, 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 8 when you have high time frame directional premise, understood, and then you look at this price of the down, it's so easy to know what the price is going to do. Every single day since the last week, all of us have been together. And every single day I've given you something that went right to the left, where I had a choice of the direction to move, where you could have taken 50 CCs down. And I'll trade that much every day. But I'm showing you, by desensitizing you to fear and greed, there's no need to do those things. What we're teaching is consistency, the ability to see things happening all the time, and also exercising willpower when not wanting to make money. So you're suppressing the desire to make money, you're developing your patience, and you're learning a great deal. You're knowing how much you're learning in these first few videos, but I'm telling you, you're going to look back on this months from now and say, man, that was a huge step. I didn't the mail. There's a certain process that the way the price is delivered, and it can't be changed. It won't be changed. Don't be afraid because you're running. 700 people is not going to turn the whole world around. Okay, and it's not doing this. It's not. So, again, in closing, take the information I'm giving you. Stuff on your mattress. Stick it in a, uh, you know, a lot of your grandkids. You know how to do it. But don't market it. Don't do that. Okay, not because I'm going to lose sales. It's just it's too good to share. And you're going to see why I kept it for so long and not wanted to do it. And hopefully you guys will take this information and just want to break it. That means not something worth selling it. Okay. Um, it's not hard to set up this video, except for there's a process you're going to learn that is very generic and it will not break, it will not stop working. And when you look at the marketplace in your charts, how much you think? Now, it doesn't matter what time you're looking at, I'm just using the difference to give you how easy it is to see when we can format. So simple, every day you're going to actually study and see how it works. The same thing happens with the weekly range. The weekly range is the same thing. Somebody goes to the college, and then there's an expansion move on Monday. Then what? There's a reversal, one, two, zero, or one day. Then what? There's another expansion move. Then 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 Believe that price moves by indicators of influence. Okay, and the influence of the indicator being lower or sold, that is what the precursor is to market moving higher or lower. And I can tell you, I described that for years as an indicator, and it took a long time for me to be broken away from that type of mindset. Um, so if you're new and you haven't been exposed to indicators, you're not affected by that. Yet, you're actually pretty good uh, in, in terms of advantage. Uh, those that like these indicators are going to have a little bit of a struggle with this membership because I'm telling you basically you need to get out of your system, get out of your charts, because it is not how you're going to be able to see smart money. In fact, we're going to use these indicators to be uh, informed as to what the uninformed creators are actually asking. So we talk about sentiment, it's not a lot more understanding about what that is, how it's developed, and what we can do with it. Now, obviously, we only expose one side of the paradigm here by specifically dealing with the state of the one from money's perspective. Uh, you're not here really so much to learn about those individuals. Obviously, you know, we all know that there's a losing crowd in the marketplace, and your idea of uh, you know, being part of that group is foolish. So we're here only to focus on what the smart money is in the marketplace. And that begins by understanding that there is a huge, vast, enormous new pool of liquidity coming in the marketplace every single day. Even though there's new funds we can't all the time, statistics tell us that 90% of traders lose money. Large funds are in the same category, not every fund is profitable just because there's a lot of people that are investing money into this fund or this fund manager does not knowing guarantee that fund will exist a year, two years, five years from now. So we as informed traders are perspective is a whole perspective of what a liquidity provider or
smart money concepts, how the banks trade first, and then you want to add indicators afterwards. I think that's perfectly fine. If it helps, it helps, but it is not needed. And you should definitely not be reliant on indicators solely by themselves. Or neutralize for their interests. And we'll talk about that as we go. But for now, understand smart money knows in fact that there is a large body of unformed money out there. Contrast that with what we spoke of concerning the unformed money perspective. There's a lack of an entity out there that has a smart money perspective. They'll have an opinion or uh, an idea based uh, perspective that there is someone or some entity or entities out there that have a smart money perspective. Or the banks will actually uh, trade against a larger top. I also forgot to add, yes, as dumb money or uninformed money, us retail traders, um, most traders are losing. But at the same time, there's just so many people trading every single day. Liquidity is always going to be there. And there is a large amount of liquidity in the market. So there's really nothing to worry about, even as many of us are losing traders. There is always going to be more traders, more money, more liquidity being dumped in. And keep in mind that not every hedge fund, every firm that trades money is going to be profitable. So it isn't just a single person like you or I. There are entities out there that are also losing a lot of money as well. Uh, firms or funds that have losing to bring away free markets. So when we have a smart money perspective in the marketplace, we actually use their perspective as everybody else's liquidity. And prices delivered to engineering efficiency smart money entities only. It's not anything outside that. So the whole perspective of liquidity provider, you are adopting a smart money perspective and everybody else is liquidity. And the liquidity is going to be in the form of buy stops, sell stops, pending orders above and below the market highs that are most recently formed in the charts. Once we understand that, there's uh, two same perspectives that would create a smart efficiency paradigm. Both of both groups, okay, have their individual perspectives. The one that is smart money, they have the unique perspective of understanding already what the unformed money is going to leave with the marketplace, and that gives them their edge. And on top of that, they're actually controlling the price. Just like anything else, if you own a storefront or if you own a business, and commodity is sold, who sets the price? But commodity, you, your storefront. Well, currency is owned by the bank, and they set the price on the value of that bank. Note for that, digital instrument is that you have the number of dollars in or francs or uh, pound or whatever is your uh, you measuring currency in. That, is, that value is set by the central bank that has printed that money. And why is it such a, uh, a speed bump for people's understanding? Is beyond because if you look at the world right now, obviously corruption and the seed is in the beginning. So uh, it's not shocked to hear if you first time being exposed to this, the central bank should absolutely control what their price of their uh, currency is. They set it any time at any price they want. Don't believe me, but what they did was Swiss franc and the euro went to bed. Instantaneous wipeout. Okay. So once we understand both perspectives, okay, instantly, okay, we no longer have a, a odds perspective on the market. Basically, what he is describing here, if you are a business owner, you are the one that's able to change the price of the products that you are selling. Well, just like the banks, they are the ones that own the money, and if they own the money, they are able to set the price for their own. Products. We don't build a high market maker, we don't build a high smart money, we don't beat up or uh, make fun of the uninformed money. In fact, we do just find a balance in between that. And we don't think in terms of victim or aggressor, we just think in terms of efficiency because the markets are always going to trade in an efficient manner, but it's slanted in more prone to lace the pockets of the smart money because they have the advantage of pricing where they want prices to go to and they already know what perspective of the uninformed money and they also know how to manipulate that perspective at any given time based on chart patterns, based on indicators, based on just reactions to market news. Now, if we go through this mentorship, we're going to focus primarily on your understanding of these four primary drivers in price delivery, trade, expansion, reversal, and consolidation. And we're going to talk specifically about that, but I want you to understand all the things we're teaching here. They're all frameworks for you to understand those four general principles. We can't teach specific contexts or topics without having a broad based understanding foundation, and that's what this entire month of is doing. It brings everybody to a reference point to start at the same location. Some of you are advanced at the last time over the years. You need to put that aside for a moment and start with this perspective in mind. I promise you can deliver everything that you skipped over. We're going to fill all those gaps. But understanding that the interbank price delivery algorithm, okay, to understand that it's going to have to come by exposure. And exposure creates experience. That experience is going to give you the understanding going into start seeing what they, what they should be doing in price, what you should be seeing in price. By seeing each individual component. Explained in detail and context, each individual part or component of the whole will be able to dovetail nicely and understand how everything fits together. But suppress that desire to feel you have to have techniques and, and patterns and intricate secrets about how the chart does this, the chart does that. You have to have a framework in mind and foundation why these things exist. Otherwise, all those little things don't make any sense to you when I'm calling you to refer to them. So, all that, what specifically should you be focusing on right now? As a new student in this membership, the first thing you need to know is there are very little things you should be bringing into your expectations and what your understanding should be. In other words, basically, what I'm saying is you need to have no previous knowledge brought in with this. Kind of like everything inside, and assume it's very difficult for those that have gone through different systems of because they have to try to forget what they already know. And even if they make money with it, the worst thing that's going to happen is if anything outside of institutional flow lets your uh, profitability, it really was just coincidence. And coincidence happened for a long time. I did it for nine months, and it involved your luck, and it didn't work again. So, understanding right now what this is what you're doing, that's important as a new mentor student. Uh, the first thing you need to be doing is creating a daily transaction log with price charts. Now, I know some of you don't want to do this. Some of you have resisted me uh, telling you for years to do this. I'm telling you, you all are here, and you paid for this membership, you paid for the understanding and experience I've gained over the last 23 plus years. I can tell you how I got it was doing the very thing I'm going to tell you to do in this specific video. It starts here. If you skip this video, if you skip on teaching you in this video, if you ignore what I'm telling you to do in regards to what specific things you start with right now, it does not mean okay, you're trading longer than anybody else until you have optional options, because you're trading with bullish bearishes, because you're trading with liquidity bullish. That is not an advantage. Okay, you need to go back to square one and understand that this is strength in your development. If you don't do these types of things, you're actually going to hurt your development and you're going to hurt and stunt your growth throughout this membership. So go back to square one. You're a new student. Do everything that's being described here and advised because this is where the money starts coming in. If you have these things in place, you start right at this very core principle. It will develop. We're going to be focusing on this throughout the entire 12 months. Everyone's going to build on rules and what things you're looking for in charts. But for right now, primarily, the only thing I want you to be doing is starting with the daily chart. Okay, you're doing your daily chart for 12 months, no less than nine months. You you have to have that much perspective on your chart. Don't have some perspective on multiple years on your chart. 12 months to nine months ideally. Then you have a four-hour chart, and your four-hour chart needs to have three months of price action views. The six-minute chart, one-hour chart has to have at least three weeks view, and the fifteen-minute chart needs to have at least three or four days view. That means for every chart here, I'm recommending a specific amount of data that needs to be displayed for that perspective timeframe. What you need to resist doing right now is you need to resist the forecast price movements. That's not for your state of development right now. You're not trying to rush ahead and try to figure out what the market's going to do next because that's going to be a problem for you. And it's only going to be frustration. We will get you there and it's going to happen in due time. But for now, resist that urge. But there are some things you need to be specifically doing with these charts. You need to note where price should be quick movement from a specific level. In other words, it's going to go higher or lower from a particular level. That's noteworthy. You need to know where you need to go in your chart. You need to also know recent highs and lows that haven't been tested. That means if the highs have formed in your chart, if the price has not come back up to that level in recent time, then you need to make a special note of that because it's going to probably be influential in the future. Vice versa. This time, you're going to be able to look for the lows that have formed that have not been recently traded. So, and that level will be influential later on in future price delivery as well. No areas on the chart where price has left clean highs and clean lows. Basically, that looks like two equal highs that formed in close proximity to
Uh, number of days the highs and the lows form, and this is the weekly range. And you want to know what time of day that occurs. Is the high and low of uh, week forming in London, or is it forming in New York? Because all those things are going well too. Prognostication, which happened going forward. And you want to know the daily high and the daily low every single trading day. And you want to know when the daily high and the daily low forms for every individual uh, trading day. Now what does that look like? Want to trade in cyber security? We don't have experience. Physical cyber security certificate. These are real world scenarios. Did you check? Like one starts off with bear charts as a daily chart, and then you single trading day. And you want to know. So here he is showing us how we should be journaling right now. I know a lot of us will come from different backgrounds and different experiences, but he is encouraging us to delete all the other knowledge we have, delete all the other preconceived notions and things like that when it comes to trading, and to treat this like a brand new trader. It doesn't matter if you already know what order blocks are, if you know what fair value gaps are, we need to sit down and take everything back to square one. And like I said before, we can always learn something new and we should always be a student. We should also not try to predict what price is going to do in the future. What he wants us to do is use the current price that we have right now based off of these four steps on point A and identifying some of the patterns that are already existing. We're not looking to see what price is going to do. We're looking at the current patterns that price is doing and most likely in the future we can, if we can identify those patterns, most likely we can continue to find areas where the patterns are most likely going to exist again. In the daily low forms for every individual uh, trade day. Now what it looks like, well, it starts off with a bear down chart, this is the daily chart, and then you the Swiss franc here, it could be any chart in here, but you want to start one currency here in this membership, you want to specifically deal with one. I recommend you doing something apart from the British pound and uh, the euro, only because you specifically deal with that uh, in this individual membership, but you want to do something with a currency here that is not being utilized in this membership that you're getting a unique perspective to yourself have arrived at uh, using this as a guideline. The first thing you want to do is obviously you know the British highs and recent lows market have shown no limits of power from. That's the first thing you want to do, because this is how you identify order blocks, this is how you identify liquidity blocks, because all the gain frames are that, but you need to know those recent highs and recent lows, that's what's in the preview here. Next, you want to drop down into a four-hour chart, and there's same level that's in the daily chart, so I'm showing here, and there's more highs and lows to come into this daily chart by doing a lower time frame perspective. We went from, again, the chart was a daily chart before, now we're going to the same level, just drop down into a four-hour chart, there's a level of change flows, Equal by high, equal low, and close proximity to one another. Any low floor market has moved quickly away from a particular level. And it creates these real big candles or bars. Okay, you're trying to know that because there are many influencing your expectations of where price should go and where it should not go. Then you're going to an hourly chart. Okay, an hourly chart, you're looking at uh, individual days, okay, over the course of one or two weeks. And you can get the weekly range uh, defined with the hourly chart and you look at the intraday highs and lows with the hourly chart. Hourly chart is really the bellwether chart for your short term trader or a trader. That's like the daily chart for uh, you know, the bottom line where you should be buyers are. And you'll see all these things, all these different details we find in this membership for now. You're getting all the values you found in the daily chart for hourly trading transfers into an hourly chart. Now, you want to keep this chart, okay, in this format, separate from all the other charts I'm going to talk about now. Okay, anything else we talk about in terms of what we're looking for, they don't get utilized in the same chart. You have two individual independent U.S. Swissy charts. Okay, you're getting carrying information on two separate charts. That way you don't have charts too busy. That's making things you're going to get confused and all kinds of things you're going to be worried about. Then you're going to create another Swiss franc chart. Okay, and for that you're going to be looking at the chart. And it's loaded, obviously, you're going to get there and nothing on there. And it's looking at the chart for a while and it's looking at the perspective without any frames of reference. And you're going to take the course of actually talking about using the daily chart in the minor chart. You do that same thing with the individual Swiss franc chart. You're only going to be applying it to the last 15, sorry, last three days, three or four days. And using those reference points in the last three or four days on the 15 minute chart. Okay, you're going to be looking at all the daily highs and the daily lows. And using this is how I do my charts on the 15 minute basis. I'm actually going to see me actually do this very practice every single day going forward starting with this week. I'm going to enter into mentorship. I'm going to go to the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows and draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out to where the previous day's highs and the previous day's lows. And draw them out
you know, by itself. Yeah, I'm saying where market may want to reach for. Um, so you're trying to measure a prognostication on your part if it doesn't do everything for you. So uh, I want to draw your attention to looking at where markets are most likely to create by conditions. Now, this is not by single entries. It's just training and context initially as a new trader, someone new to the analysis, someone new to my principles. It's going to give you a foundation so you know the charts are looking at these things and measure them and then study them. Okay. So all this is meant is to give you a framework to work in your demo account. Everyone should be working inside the Forex LTD demo account that's established um, at the beginning of this mentorship. So we have multiple price swings in here. So on this daily chart, primarily daily chart, uh, initially for ourselves. If you're a new trader, okay, and you're overwhelmed, you probably heard me talk about certain things already in this membership. Maybe watch some of my videos on YouTube or on websites, the first section, and your turn from where you're headed. Some of the terms are created by me, some of them are industry standards. Uh, some require a little, little bit more uh, description about what they mean later on in the membership. So here's even in this presentation. This is a little bit of new notes, and obviously you'll pick up the understanding as you go deeper every month or something new. But for now, I want you to focus on a simple question. If a trader believes the market's going to go higher, what would frame that context? What would give the trader that in a conclusion to trust buying specific market? Let's go into making a decision. Well, the first thing I want you to understand is this is the very first baby step to understand the institutional flow. The first thing you need is movement. You have to understand that to be a buyer, there has to be a willingness of somebody with bigger, uh, bigger pockets than you, more money than you, and they're the ones that move price around, and they are the banks. Okay? Uh, they're, they're only going to let price go higher when it suits their purpose. Okay? So, if they're going to be a factor, it's going to be a greed factor. They want money. Okay? They're investing money after all. That's the nature of business. That's the thing. So, if you're looking for buying opportunities, okay, maybe tell traders look for all of these patterns and indicator-based ideas, and I want you to focus primarily on price. Price alone will give you everything you ever need in terms of indicating higher or lower price. You know, I have to give you access to specific entries, and you have to see anything else outside of price chart. Okay, I'm going to go to everything for you. And I'll show this high up here. Okay. You see how that is the biggest price swing on this entire chart. So between August 14th all the way to the present time in September, there is only been one major price swing higher and lower. So if we get a Fibonacci level, okay, and I'm going to use Fibonacci to illustrate equilibrium. Okay, so I'm trying to establish what equilibrium is. This is the largest price range, okay, for the market range that's presently being traded. And what I mean by present market range is the highest range we've seen, okay, in the last month or so. So if we look at this range, and I'm going to scroll back, you can see there's nothing more significant than the next step. We're going to find out that it has a very strong reaction. We can use these back here, okay, and I'll do a couple of things later on the video. We're going to see a very strong impulsive move away. When it comes back, we trace it, and have no strong impulsive move away. All the time, okay. When we say impulsive price move forward, what we refer to as impulsive price swing going forward throughout this membership. That is the indication that there is a displacement. And displacement is where someone, a wild money, okay, comes in the marketplace and they have a strong conviction to move price higher. By the central bank. So if they're letting price run this high, they're offering a higher price. As long as they're buying something in, they're going to be buying a price there. As long as they keep buying buyers, they keep raising prices up, they'll keep raising prices higher. No, there is no longer any interest for the pair orders with participants. Okay, I'll open interest in the marketplace. So they'll allow price to retreat a little bit until they can get more buy stop above the marketplace. It is not a buy, 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 buy market and they keep on uh, stretching price. They have already bought down here and then they're allowing price to be uh, offered to marketplace at higher prices. Okay, and as it happens, they're all doing this. It's selling off their position. They establish that lower low. Okay, from here, the bankers are in the long position. They're in the position. Once they get in position, they allow price to go higher. Okay, once that price goes higher, 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 it keeps going higher until their position is funded and they no longer want any more uh, position held. So they're looking for areas where they know they're going to be willing to buy. That's going to be above this whole high. Why do they want to take price above that high? Here, because they're going to be buy stops on the fund level. That means big money, uh, many funds, buy stops are really above that high. And I'm going to go into detail in this membership about where stops are, how they got where the stops are at. So what I'm getting so far is that in a bullish market, we need to focus on the bullish moves, specifically the major swing points. That's why he pulled out his Fibonacci tool from this swing low, represented by the 100%, and dragged it all the way up to the top of this, which is the 0%. So he is just highlighting the major swing points he's also describing that we need to focus on this because this is where the buyers are present in order for price to push on higher somebody with bigger pockets bigger money had to buy the market to move price on higher and basically as price is pushing on back what is going on is that they are taking profits off of those buy positions and if you notice he's highlighting some highs over here what is going to be above these highs some buy stops he hasn't fully broken broken down exactly what liquidity is with buy stops and sell stops. If he doesn't go over it, I will break it down more in detail. But simply put, there are buy stops above here. So when price attacks those buy stops, triggers those stop losses, they are able to take profits off of their orders and allow price to push on down. Where I target big money losing occur. All these things we talked to you for now is going to start very small. There's a lot of folks that just started this membership and they've never really been through the complete library of my uh, concepts or they haven't really exposed themselves to anyone else. So all this is Greek to them. Now I'm going to be Greek, but it's an expression of six means appealing to them. But the first thing I want you to look for in price is when you see impulsive price swings. Okay, and since we're going to discount markets okay, and relative terms to equilibrium, we first have to understand what an impulsive price swing is. So let me take this off real quick. Move back to that price level right here. Take all this off over here. Okay, so we have one big strong impulsive price swing right here comes off this level and rallies up. We don't need to know what causes the buy on here. It's not interesting at all to me. I don't care. Okay, we don't know this price line is going to start until I'm sorry, we know this price line is here. Okay, until it forms. So I'm giving you a perspective. Studying hindsight. The low to the time here, okay, that rallied up, right, impulsive price swing. We only require prices to start coming down off of that, and it takes at least four candles. No, what time you one, you need four candles, okay, from the market makes up the low, start rallying up. What you're going to look for is once you see a high form, wait a minute, once you see a high form, you need four candles, buy four candles. You need to have one candle to the left, one candle to the left, those highest one, and the lower candles to the right, that's sun high, and then you see price go lower. When that happens, you start waiting for price to retrace back to equilibrium. Now, what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is a midway point of a price move, okay, so we're matching the high from this low, you drop up to the low, you drop it. Equilibrium, over here, let me just a little bit more. Okay, so we have so the price swing goes higher. As soon as we get three candles, then and only then will we start watching for price to come down to the equilibrium price point. And that is basically the Fibonacci level, 50%. Okay? We're looking for price to come down to that level. And as soon as it comes back to that level, in our daily chart, we go down to a lower time frame and we hunt buying opportunities. Now, I'm not teaching buying entry signals, okay? I'm giving you context of how to discern when the market goes to discount and when it's at premium. And we're not trading premiums, okay? Well, I'll teach you these premiums uh, the first video of next week, okay? So uh, we're going to primarily on equilibrium versus discount. We have a price swing that moves from low, but basically up. We don't do anything until we start seeing a down move. It has to happen after three candles, basically, the next time. So equilibrium is the halfway point or the 50%, and discount is going to be underneath the equilibrium level. Now, sometimes, looks like this. Maybe see it as high, and candles to the left is lower, and candles to the right is lower. That's sun high. And once that sun high forms, we're waiting for the fourth candle
If you get something fair market value, obviously you're not paying premium, but you're not getting a discount either. But it's still a neutral Google's condition. That means you're not buying at an inflated price. So this time period right here, the market is offering an opportunity to be long. I'm not going down the lower time frame today. I'm not going to teach you today. I'm going to develop context around the daily institutional price levels that are arrived at when we get a chart. And we're looking for impulsive price comes first. Lay price level back down into equilibrium. And then this time we're going to do once we move to that level. But you can see, without going lower time frames, the price does rally again. Where's it rally back up to? It's old institutional order flow reference point, which is an old high back here. So it goes way above that previous high. See that? Now, market trades off again and goes lower. So we have now a new, new range. We have now the Fibonacci on this high, kicking out the same low. Now, why do I do that? Because this price level is not a value. It only retraced down here, rather than again. Then we leave for five candles. The high candle to the left of the low one, to the right of the low one, is about the Sunday. Any sell this one here? Either way, you don't want to count these. By the way, 94, one else, of course, LTD does give you this many candles. You gotta check that out. Don't, don't count some of these candles. And not even. So, it's probably going to end up coming this candle here. Once you get down here, there's a market as, uh, in fact, turn. It's starting to lower. This is what's happening here. We're not rushing. We don't need to test the high. Okay, it gives us all kinds of time to wait and plan and build an idea about what it is that we want to do when price gets to equilibrium. Price drops down, little more, and it goes up. Little bit of time is happening. Nothing. Nothing. This is our time principle. Most of you are all thinking for our time principle. But this is the building blocks of that. Okay, market trades lower, 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 like I said, he's not giving entry signals just yet. I'm sure he will later on. But the idea is, is that we should be buying at equilibrium or in discount. If price is above equilibrium, which is technically going to be premium in this case, we should not be looking for longs or we should just not be looking to trade at all, essentially. Uh, we want to see price come down lower. So in these situations, it's okay to be patient, allow price to come on lower to where you anticipate price to come and find that high probability buy setup. Well, they will be able to buy at these levels, not at a premium based market. The levels that are trading at this level here are fair market value. Now, thanks to anyone else, if you go to the grocery store and you see stakes for $10, uh, I don't know what you call it, the uh, stake costs $10 is the best market, uh, and it drops down to $8.80 if it's probably, you know, a discount. And it may not be that price, I don't know, but for sake of analogy, we're using it. Um, that means that we're not at a discount. Anything below equilibrium is now discount market. discount market. When markets go below equilibrium, they do not spend much time below equilibrium, and there's usually a very dynamic price move away from that, especially if the content of the market is bullish. Now, look at this point we have here. We have an impulse price line here. So we have a little time we're tracing at equilibrium, but I want to talk about it. I'm higher here, and it's sold off. Okay, but back down into equilibrium, we're getting into a discount. Below 50% of the impulse price line, so the market one, the banking perspective is that this now is not a discount, is allowed to be bought. And just don't go into the remaining 95% because it goes back to 50% or less. There's not enough you've got to have more information. But for now, it's going to give you when we have a bullish scenario for a market. Okay, if you think it's bullish, we look for impulsive price swings on the daily chart frame, higher time frame ideas. There's other trades you can take in lower time frames in between these, but for now, I want you primarily focus on just this because it'll give you all the things you've probably been lacking for higher time frame ideas and reading blocks of directional bias. This is daily. It gives you a lot of time to have the same amount of chart. You don't have to have the same amount of time 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 to
when it's low to this high, you get high, a low, a low, a low, when this one, and we're already below the equilibrium. Look at the high thing, we went through it. I'm not going to talk about the blockchain, but I'm going to right now. <laughs> so you got to do what I'm talking about, what I'm to say. But here we expect price to be sensitive in here. Okay, because we're below 50% equilibrium, we're in discount, price should not send a sign at all, it quickly rallies away. Okay, it comes back down. I draw the one that's low to this, I'm not going to do it. And that's capitalized, it's not going to do it. I'm going to say the one all these levels where it should be reaction. Okay, market rallies up. Here's the stuff's on high. The next thing on the portion, it's going to be lower, it does. It's going to be trading through equilibrium, 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 it's going to be trading through Day sales, okay, but it's easy to If you look at the news, we here, using what I'm showing you. If you walk down here, just this is Here, it's 272 bits. If you hold on to it, it's 400 bits. So this price is going here. Price should be sensitive right here. Otherwise, we're about to figure you're one of those. But the number one thing I just showed you, it's still there. And watch this. We had a price on here. Then we have a little shitty bullish. Here's a price right here. We're going to go higher and higher. So we have a price on that's going higher. So we make this high form. Down here, right here. Equilibrium right here. Equilibrium is discount. It's got to be below equilibrium. If the market is below equilibrium, we are in a discount market and it should not go below the old forms. That low starts from, it can't go below that. So, that's what we're doing. It's doing a framework to work within. Okay, I don't even know exactly where I'm buying at. I just know it's going to be a framework. I find that down below the framework is going to be tied down south. I'll see that. But for now, if you're going to get this below the order, a stop loss has to be below there. When it's time frame. So, we can buy this area here. We're stop loss down 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 here.
because price has not made a new high. So technically price is still in discount relative to this range. So even though we can still use this low to this high and see prices in discount, we can still technically work from this low to this high and see that price is still in discount. Price is just giving a very complex pullback or just giving very complex internal structure, but price is still in bullish structure. That bullish sentiment is still there. This bullish fib is still valid and price is, in, price is still in discount. And I think that four candlestick rule is very interesting as well. I'll have to take a deeper look into that. But but yeah, understanding that four candlestick rule to kind of validate if price is giving you that swing point or giving you that reversal, I think that could be very crucial as well. So here, good point. Um, if you're in a buy position down here, yes, like I said, I think I said it a little bit while ago. Overall, we're anticipating price to take out this high. And if we're allowing price to not take out this high and come down and hit our stop loss and things like that, we're simply being greedy because price takes out this high. There's his, an opportunity for us to take some uh, profits or just close the entire position. Price also takes out this high. But if you're waiting for this swing high to get taken out and you get stopped out, you're just simply being greedy. There was plenty of times before where you could have taken partials or taken your profits off the table. Also, you're showing down here the OTE zone, which I think is the entire area between the 62% and the 79%. This is going to be um, the greatest or just be a great area for us to look for buy opportunities, specifically in discount. Okay. 
So, so far, all of this makes sense. The only question that I have is trying to figure out exactly when you decide to delete the fib or when you decide to change the range that you're looking at. I'm assuming if obviously price breaks underneath the 100%, there is no reason to use a fib. But for example, here in this case, he was using this low to this high price came into discount and then made a new high. In this case, I probably would try to use this low to this high. And as you can see, price gets very deep into discount still while still respecting this low. But instead of using this low to this high, he still decided to use the same low, but continue to expand the high to here. My assumption is you can use either or, but he didn't really address it in this video. So hopefully in the future, it'll make a tad bit more sense. I wanted to go back there real quick because he's actually saying that he doesn't believe shorting or longing in this case since we're working with premium shorting and equilibrium is a great idea and I actually agree with that as well usually when I want to trade in premium I actually want to see price get to the 62% or higher for me to consider it a good short opportunity so uh, that's just something that I agree with as well and so far, this is a, the exact same thing as what we just went over, price and discount. But now this is flipped in a bearish market. We'll be using swing high down to swing low. And anything above the 50% or equilibrium will be considered premium. 
uh, for market VIP in this current price range here, and assuming another price actually for this high, then I'll always do right. And I have the so you'd be watching price in this initial range. And price did not get back up to the midway point of the uh, uh, the range that's creating the high or low. That's all equilibrium is that's how I'm describing it. The concept is you have to get a market price a move above halfway point. Once it does that, start to start going to the first of the premium market. And it's at a really high price relative to its current trading range. We all need the raw result indicators to help us uh, classify your raw result market. We just need to know the current price range for trading. And if we get above 50% level, then you start getting into what we deem as overbought or a premium level. Uh, the price here, obviously, you're getting above 50% level. So 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 you're getting above 50% same thing from this high to this low. No, nothing in terms of that price line. There, doesn't get back to the uh, level, but look closer. There's another smaller price line that has formed right in here. Okay, so we look at that. Measure high to the low, and the market is right to the premium, but does not stay above the total premium market only the right to the Fibonacci 50 level, what we deem as equilibrium. The price goes to equilibrium price point, and then immediately sells off. This will give us opportunity in regards to looking at equilibrium to premium. The reason why we want to focus primarily on the 62 or 70 levels in that range is because we sell them short. It is the market going to be really priced higher, and would be really in terms of the overall result, it would be very overbought, and it would be expecting a bonus to sell softer to lower. Um, there's many times the market does not give that scenario to you, and you sell that there's a particular price to go value. The next price line is this high to this low. Market back up to equilibrium. I also do like how he points out sometimes price will not pull back up to premium and sometimes you may miss an opportunity because of that but that is perfectly fine that definitely does happen at times opportunity simply due to the fact that price is in premium or in that OTE area price basically will probably would have stopped you out in this case you could have done one or two things you could have used a form of a turtle soup sell which we have not gone over just yet to take that short opportunity or you could have zoomed out and used a fractal fib or a fractal swing um, range from this swing high down to this swing low and as you can see price actually took out this high most likely to take out some buy set liquidity to get deeper into premium or in that OTE area before going lower. My first question or concern here is what would give the reasoning or what kind of context clues did you have to know that price was going to continue to push on lower rather than giving you some type of break of structure, market structure shift of some sort to then reverse price to go higher? What gave the confluence or bias that price would actually continue to go on lower. All we're seeing is the reverse of that in the equilibrium versus premium market. So we're always going to sell a premium is defined by as the equilibrium price point or the amount of percent level of anchored on a uh, swing of clear discernible price action. Or if it looks sloppy, it doesn't really look like a solid price line, and obviously obvious price line is going to look at. I'm not looking at anything that looks questionable. If it's a pure price line, we measure it. And this is high, and this is low, and we went through all the potential stages of all these high, low, high, low, high, low scenarios. Really nice scenario here, again, taking a potential below this low here, and when we hit that, and you hold out for a potential one percent of your trade, you take out below this low here. Now, market goes into another uh, area of premium relative to equilibrium. We go back to this larger price line here. This low, all at this high, market right into 70 percent level. Hit the perfect to the pit, then rolls down. Where do you take the profits at? You're going to take profits at low this low here, okay? Into the order block down here, which we see right there, okay? You have another range that you can use this high to this low, okay? Now, what's really nice about this is if the market's consolidation, this type of trade is your go to, okay, on a long protractionary state market where it goes it's up and down, no, no real movement higher in one direction or lower in one direction. It's a state in the market's consolidation. You want to change total suits for understanding where premium and discount are. And if you have the high here and pull down the low here, when the market's above equilibrium right here, you go right into the 70.54 would be the option. It's a sweet spot, okay? And market is all there, where you're going to take profits at below and low. Or below this low right there. Every time the market makes a swing low, you have to take a look at the three candles. Why do you not use the, the Williams uh, fractal? It requires five candles. I only need three candles. So we have a candle low here, a lower candle low here, a small, small lower candle here. The market blows through that over your, uh, your target. You take your profit. Then you come back and you end up taking your stop out right there. Now, if you get stopped, 
and take for profit. Say you're greedy, you're patient, you're developing, you just don't want to do anything to take some profits out. What couldn't happen for you to do it like that? Microsoft has to take some profits out. If you see that scenario, okay, you're looking for old highs to be breached while we're above the 50% level. So we're in, we're in deep premium. Okay, so markets are overbought in here. Market runs through this previous high. So we're in total suit scenario. We're looking for total suit sales. Market comes up, starts coming down. One more time, runs through real. Take your again. This is going to happen in your trade. Do not, not try to avoid it because it's going to happen. It's the same scenario. We have old high, market goes back above it. If it's at a premium and you define a range here, you take the scenario that sells on a total suit basis. For each of the old high, sell short. We're going to take profits out. Below first low. That's here. The next low is right here. And we have another range right here. So while we're watching this one, so you see a similar form of this down here. We're going to probably run back into this range here. Now we have a new range. Do you have a price swing? Is this high? Now this low. Here's equilibrium, price expands to equilibrium, once you start seeing that, we watch the 62, it does, it buys the candle stock perfectly right here. You can sell short right here, it looks nice, as you can see the bottom of the candle, it's candle, that's the bigger one, so we'll run down. That's a sell, buy, sell, we're going to take profits out below the old low, right in here. Go down below that, it does what? Trade that up higher. If we use the price swing, from the high, we just enter to this low, the same thing first here, we have this high, all we have is the price low, price comes all the way to the next price low, above equilibrium, we're watching, now we're in here where the price is going into equilibrium, I'm sorry, from equilibrium, I'm going to premium, okay, premium is above equilibrium, and it brings it to the high low, and look at that, we're running down the area, it'll stop the bottom high, again, very, very good, uh, probably short, here's the swing here, trade down to that, you have to take profits below here. Smart trade down to, small consolidation here, and I'm not going to find anything else in this chart that will go on top of things. They will look at things, but they will go on top of things that look at it, it has to do with this candle here. So we'll refer to this candle later on, we capitalize the whole short box, and the short box. But, the market trades another range. This high, down to this low here. This high, down to this low, market is well equilibrium here, we're going to go to, and we're going to go to the ECT2 centration level. It does that, there's a 7.5 OZ, up to the entry, and then it sells off rate to profits at low swing low, rate to swing low, rate to profits right here. Now, they're not astronomical trades, okay, they're not enormous trades, but, they get shorted here at 98 figure and covering below the low in the same level here at 96 and 4. That's over 100 pips. Nothing wrong with that. This is the daily chart trading, although. Again, this is how can you folks that cannot be doing day trades, okay? You don't need a regular movement on a daily chart to make a decent amount of pips. We're going back to this high and use that same old low here, okay? From this high down to this low, if you went short here, they don't stop from above here. And we're premium, we're above the equilibrium, we're defining our range. We're looking to sell into strength. It's here when you first start looking at it as a trader, but that's exactly what you want to do in the first trade. You want to be selling at premium prices. But you can sell something, you want to sell your car, you want to sell it at discount, that doesn't make any sense. You want to sell it at premium. So, a sell their long positions or they sell new short positions at premium prices. Then you can go to the world, sell short or sell long, 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 9739. So here, if you've never used the FIB, essentially what you're doing is, as we gone over, of course, we're trying to identify premium and discount. And why that is important is because if you are in a bearish market and with the idea of the banks are the ones controlling the market and pushing price lower, would they rather sell at a discounted price or at a premium price? Think about it um, in a way of you selling your car. Would you rather sell your car for a higher price, a more premium price, or a lower price and a discounted price? I think we can agree that we would want to sell it for a higher price and make more profits. So the same thing with the banks. They want to sell in the premium areas rather than discounts. Also note that he is using many different fibs from different fractal perspectives. I know it can be very confusing, especially if you are a newer trader, but for now, try to keep it very simple. Don't draw all these fibs everywhere as he's kind of doing. Just try to focus on one range at a time, and as you progress, maybe you can start to zoom out and use different swing points. And the last thing I'll go over is if you notice, like even in this case, if he has a bearish fit from this swing high to swing low, Price comes up into premium, taking out an old high, taking out buy sell liquidity. And he is basically saying we can use a turtle suit model or a bearish sell turtle suit model to take a short. Ultimately, we probably would anticipate or want to see price take out this low down here. But just because this is the low we anticipate price to take out doesn't mean price will do so. Price will take out a low, but it doesn't have to be the lowest low or the highest high. So in this case, as we're taking shorts, as you can see, this low gets taken out, so this will be a great area for us to take a um, take profit, basically. And just try not to get too greedy, even though price may not play out fully in your favor. With this being the daily chart, seeing this big bearish daily candle, this is going to be still a great opportunity for us to catch pips or for using this in the futures markets. Um, basically, count or sorry basically catch a lot of points or ticks as well. You know, you're not, you're not forced to do ICT, you know, teaching through, which is actually trading, but the same concepts appear in the entire financial charts. They're not the same way, they're teaching you on a 15-day basis, because all the concepts are universal. And it's hard for you to understand that as a new trader, because it seems like I can't be watching the charts that are trading, it's not true, it's not true at all. So, by having these ideas of looking at prices over the course of a premium market, you go down to a, so you go down to an hourly chart. Well, Black Friday, we guarantee you'll get a profit and we'll get a single penny. Plus, we'll get a profit and we'll get a single penny. This Black Friday, it's how it works. Okay, most of you don't have to trade the buys. Most people are always asking me, hey, can, can you give me a, a way of trading with a uh, daily buy? Can you trade the buys? I'm like, well, you don't need to know that. You don't need to know that. You don't need to know. And really, you don't need to know that you need to know how to trade the entire range. Because there's ranges are always there. Whether you're trading the market or you're in the universal market, there's profile will always give you ranges to trade, and you don't need to work out a range, and you don't need to work out a range. We have some time here. So I'm not using this one, Michael. Not this one here, not this one here. This is the most recent one, probably this down here. I can use this one here, but I'm going to use this one more price down here. It's high, down to the lowest low. Okay, market trades up to equilibrium here. Okay, does it get to premium? No, it doesn't get out of here. It comes down to the lowest low, and then trades right into the same nice and consistent level right here. Close the range, which we'll talk about in the next teaching. Over here, market sale, it sells off. And where are you going to take profits at? You have a small level here, you have some real good level here. So you're getting short here, and on our thesis, so you got short at 97.70, nice round number. To get that low here is 42 pips, to get that low here is 60 pips, so you go 10 pips below that. 
That'll give you, oh, it'd be nice to have any tips. It'd be nice to have any tips. And Don't tempt it to lawyers. You get this range low and a high fear where we've been selling at. Based on concepts, and advanced like technical and mindset here, conceptual ideas, and saying, oh, we're going to see tips. Tempt it to low, be 70. You got at least four tips below that for uh, strength. Yeah, and absolutely does that. And that's not very much low at all. I'm going to focus on ICT with a sixth installment of the eight teachings of September 2016 ICT membership. We're going to specifically dealing with fair evaluation in this teaching. And fair evaluation comes in the form of two perspectives. Fair value in regards to equal distance of a high or low, what we call equal room, or fair value for perspective on valuation in regards to parameters. And I'm going to both of them to give you the perspective that you have when you look at price. This is actually a chart that we mapped out in advance talking about a lot of these very specific things here uh, in the week of this total production, uh, September 24, 2016. Um, we called Australian dollar higher based on the things that I'm going to cover here. I was aiming for 7665 as a weekly objective, and you can see here, you already did not hit that. We have led to these ideas behind me giving these outside objectives from an area down here. Well, first, you have to understand a lot of overlap from what we discovered in previous two sessions that being equilibrium to discount and equilibrium to premium. Um, obviously, your buyers are going to be buying when you're looking at the discount market, and you're trading the lower third of the current trading range that markets. Uh, presently, you're currently trading in the most recent impulse like or impulse price line. The sales are best taken in the most current trading range or impulse price line, upper third portion of that range. Okay, that's a premium market, which is a premium. When the market returns back to an area of fair value, that is a fair value for the market maker to either sell or buy. In this case, whatever, again, both concepts in regards equilibrium and the fair valuation for market maker participation in the transaction. This swing here, this is higher, the market broke down, and it quickly ran away. And this is what we call a liquidity void. The market makes a sudden movement lower, it's large ranges, very little wicks, very quick movement. That is a void. It means the price is very little time trading these price levels, and it's going to down to this area where it's trading more efficiently, back and forth on both sides of the candle, and ultimately retracement. This range in here, as you can see, pops a price action where there's a sudden movement lower. This is where we saw a quick sudden movement lower here. This up candle, at the bottom of that, that's where we start watching and measuring fair value. And the down candle here, very nice candle, so we start looking at the range between this up candle and this up candle. Between those two up candles, there's what's referred to as a fair value gap. Okay, fair value gap. The reason why this is important is because there's no up candle or up movement between the break of that low and high of this candle here. It's all just straight down movement. So nothing filled in this area. Once price broke this low, it left it open. Basically, it's a gap. The same thing occurs here when this up candle is broken here. When this candle starts breaking lower, there's a gap between this candle's low and this candle body or wick. Okay, so I find the body how to use those. The range in which it causes this void, okay, when price is below that, this is going to be fair value. Okay, marks don't want to come back to that because there's very little trade here. Just because there's a gap because there's no movement up in this area here between this up candle's low and this up candle's high. This area in price action only saw down movement. Then having up candle movement, only down movement. All this down here is down candle price action only. Big ranges, so this is a liquidity void. The fact that it creates in big ranges in speed, that's what defines it. Now, because price moves so quickly in these areas, fair value is established because there's going to be a limit to the price trade out of these levels and closing all this. In order to be up movement later on, it won't happen immediately always. Sometimes it takes a little time, sometimes it takes a little time, sometimes it takes a little time. But when price starts to move higher, we know we'll try to trade this range here and fill it in another time. That is where market makers view fair value. Now, equilibrium or fair value in regards to equilibrium. So, real quick, when he's talking about this fair value concept, um, as you can see, there's this bullish candle represented by green, and then you have a couple black bearish candles right after if you notice after price went down lower there was a very small pullback represented by this green bullish candle what he's showing is from this low to this high price never pulled back to fill or come back to this wick low so right here there's going to be some form of a fair value gap since price did not come back up and fill that area <clears throat> same thing right here this is a little bit more distinct though. We have three big bearish candlesticks. If you notice, price slightly starts to pull back, but then continues to go lower. What he is showing here is price does not pull back up here to fill in this gap. Um, I know sometimes we can just, well, I don't want to get too far ahead, but usually with fair value gaps, we will mark the fair value gap from the first candle's wick low to the third candle's wick high. And mark that up, which that is a fair value gap. But as of right now, he's showing it from a fractal perspective of this entire move. We have a push up. This will basically be one big bearish candlestick down and then a slight pullback here. So this entire thing here is a fair value gap, which I believe also is the exact same thing as a fair value gap. Or I think I said um, a liquidity void is the same thing as a fair value gap as well. So that's basically all he is showing here. And when he sees this, he has a good understanding or a good idea that price will come back up into these areas to fill it. Equal distance, uh, range between high and low, but the time high low range. That being, if we have this low here and this high here, if we find that with it, okay, we have equilibrium right here, or 50% of that range from this high, this high, to this low. We have equilibrium. Okay, what the you can say about that? We have a lot of work around that equilibrium price line. That in, that in itself is significant because it's showing you the market ran through it short term high. Once it ran through it, it came back down, right back to the middle of the range, or fair value, which is equilibrium. At this moment, price could stay in this installation for a period of time. Any like, we don't know how long price can stay in this but at equilibrium, you need to refer to where the most recent price line took place. In other words, if we're at equilibrium here, or at fair value, we're going to go either way this price level. The easiest way to determine where the most popular direction is, is where the market structure break most recently. Did it break the swing high, or did it break the swing low most recently? Well, there's no swing low in here, it's significant, so there's a swing high up here. They broke through here. So when you need this low, price ran through it, clearing up these highs, right on the stock handle. Price come back down into equilibrium, we define the range from here to here. As you're looking at price, always want to get a feel for where you're at in regards to this current trade range. Also notice that we are in the lower portion of the range defined by this high and this low. So we're in a real low area where we're able to be deemed oversold. So we have a range concept blending with the fact that we're moving back in the middle of a smaller consolidated trade range with a market structure break of recent high in here, broke high, and back to equilibrium. So high probability in terms of direction is going to be going short or going long. Well, obviously it's going to be going long, but the, the mechanics behind it was the fact that we broke this one high, we have this void in here. Here, okay, 
we have weaknesses in dollar tree. I'm not talking about correlation between dollar based analysis or on the first section one here. But we led to this bullish movement in dollar this week. Specifically, we went back into fair value or equilibrium. So that way, it's fair value for the market makers to build in long positions or build a net long book. That means they're building accumulating long positions. The down candle right before this move up to a short time, that is a bullish overbought. So price comes down into that. It's at the same time as equilibrium and it's being fair value. It's fair value because the market trade back down to where it would to be bought again, where it should be expected to be buying. We don't want to buy up here because we're going to be buying up here. We'll be buying a premium. And that's not what you want to do. So you're blending a couple things when you're looking for high probability setups. To get fair valuation, you're looking at the current range from high to low. In this area right here, we're lower end of that range. So we have a lot more upside building a premium, like we just discussed in the previous tutorial. Okay, the market will go to a premium. Okay, the market's buying at a discount. Okay, and it's at equilibrium. It's at fair valuation. Because we're so right here, he doesn't have the higher time frame or the bigger fractal uh, fib up. But if you have a fib from this swing high all the way down to the swing low, you can see that price is still in discount. If the banks or the market makers are going to short, they will want to short most likely in premium. So since price is down here in discount, it is more likely that price will go bullish up into premium before shorting. So if that's the case, we can use a fractal fib. If I can take away the closed captions from this swing low to swing high, as you can see, price comes down into equilibrium underneath the 50% in discount, taps into this order block, this last sell to buy move, and we can use this as an opportunity to long up into premium and then look for shorts. From the low in the range, from this high to this low, and we have all this open price action right here. So the market won't, won't come for that yet. It doesn't have to come all the way up to this, you know, low, so there's four blocks, I can't wait for the move. All this is needed to give us a directional bias. We have a swing high here, we know what's going to be all that, buy stops. So we know that there is a strong likelihood that because of the low in the total range, which is this low, this high, this is the price from this high to this low, we create a short term low that was higher, we broke through, we high, came back down into the distance of the high to the low, that is equilibrium, we're now at fair valuation for what? For longs. The market can build a net long book at this price level. Now, if they're going to do that, they're going to look for fair value above the marketplace, where they can do what? Sell their positions at a fair value for them. Up here, if traders are buying this price, are they buying a fair value? No, they're buying a premium. Remember what we just discussed in regards to equilibrium to premium. The range from this high to this low, we're above the percent level. And here, we're in that upper portion of the optimal trade street, which is the level. I'll show you what that looks like. The low to high. 7% level, 7.5, 60% level. So we're right up into 7% So we're in premium here. We're, we're below equilibrium here. So we're at discount down here relative to the range. Down here, we're at discount. Okay, in terms of looking at the, the low time, this is where the premium is built in. If we reverse it and look at the range in opposite terms, defining it from low to high, we're below the 7% level. So we're really at deep discount. Really, really deep discount. So we're below equilibrium, above the range high and the low. We're even below the 7% level here. So in terms of really being suppressed, in terms of the total range high to low, we are at deep discount in the middle of the current small trade range from this high to this low. So we're at equal distance, price measurement of high, middle, low. In a total end or lower one third of the range of the current price point we see here. Right here, okay. Even if you didn't see this high to low as the current price line, this price line, high to low, still gives you the same context as a small, small scale. So you have high to low, we're in the lower one third here, and we're at deep discount. Here's equal distance or equilibrium, we're below zero discount. So the valuation of the market is going to long would be so many overlapping factors there. They could be building long positions or turning long positions here, looking for what the equilibrium of the market is anywhere. But besides, it's just so off of. Then you have the buy stops up here. So the market runs through that, takes those stops, runs through this short term high here, and then what's the deal? There's an acceleration. Now, if it's a troll suit and it wants to go lower after blowing out buy stops, it should go lower quickly. It doesn't do that. It's saying it's a solid acceleration. In fact, from this week, I take five sessions explaining how this market was going to higher prices. It went back into acceleration, which means it's going back into what? It's building equilibrium. Because the equilibrium is building again in a smaller range. So you find high and long distance here, looking for what the market is anywhere. But besides, it's just so off of. Then you have the buy stops up here. So the market runs through that, takes those stops, runs through this short term high here, and then what's the deal? There's an acceleration. Now, if it's a troll suit and it wants to go lower after blowing out So this is a good point here. He's basically pointing out as price ran above this high here. You can see how price consolidates sideways. If this was going to be a sell turtle soup model, price wouldn't be in this area for that long. Price would fall away fairly quickly. But in this case, as price is consolidating after sweeping this high, it is a good indication that price is going to continue to go higher rather than go lower. Buy stops. It should go lower quickly. It doesn't do that. It's staying in a solid consolidation. In fact, from this week, I take you by session explaining how this market was going to point to higher prices. It went back into consolidation, which means it's going back into what? It's building equilibrium. Because the equilibrium is building again in a smaller range. So you find a high and the low right there. So then how much price has spent around the equilibrium price point. Okay. So it's hanging around fair value. Okay. One slight move lower. Doesn't see price go lower in the range. And it expands to the upside. Once it expands to the upside, it starts filling in all this. And again, this is another area of fair value. The market's fair for those long positions. The market that are you long one. It's because it's a good area in this straight area. I'm going to this out time. Right here. All this is a good place for them to sell the longs they started accumulating down here. Look how much time they went back and forth in that range, all these wicks. Okay, they're selling, 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 all this is right here, here, and down here, and down to the store. Once this range is closed in, the next area of the concern is above the short term high. So I would fill in right here, it's filled in. So this is no longer a area of interest no more. Now we still look for higher prices. Why do we still look for higher prices? Because they went long here. Okay, so if they're going to look at the position, where do we look at the position at? The same price is premium. premium. But the premium price that speculators would trade at by buying and chasing price is a premium to price chasers. They would feed off the desire of being a price moving higher. It's fair value to market maker to liquidate their positions at the smaller high between this low, this low, and this high. So we can now create a new specific area of fair value for the market maker to liquidate their long positions in here. Right here. So don't have that time. That's just here. Price number into buy my candle, it's perfectly, tip it. Buy the candle or still be inside shade area for that fair valuation. What makes it fair is because they bought it at a deep discount and liquidating at a premium. It's fair for the generally here and it's fair for them to liquidate. So market has had a deal in terms of valuation for their longs and their shorts and have to do the same valuation for their excess on both sides of the marketplace. So when we see inefficiency in the price that we see here, we can just only go down the moment, only going down here and moment until later on. All this here is scaling up position here, here, and here. When price moves in defined trade ranges, there's going to be equilibrium. Equilibrium is in itself fair value. That means the market is holding in consolidation. When that consolidation gives way, the strongest move out of consolidation on the long or hard time frame chart will give you a great deal of for what I mean by that is if you look at price, and people look at it like this. 
you can look at price like and this high down this low so you have a range that's there okay the market's in this range here consolidates you go right back to the equilibrium and you're equilibrium dips down below the equilibrium so even if we're monitoring this range from this high to this low we're below the equilibrium price point so are we a premium right here or are we a discount we're a discount traders want to be low we're going to see this as a selling point we're going to make it short because we're going to see this high to this low coming out to 62 centuries low and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're going to see the last two centuries and we're Usually, if you're looking for long in this case, you would definitely use the swing low down here to high and see that price is in discount. But also, if you have a bearish bias and people think that this is going to be a structure high or just a high to a low, price pulls back. Most likely, they believe that this is a lower high that is going to lead to a lower low. They would have their fib out just like this, and they would actually see this as an indication with these bearish candlesticks that price actually does want to continue to go on lower. But he's actually arguing in this case. Whether you use the bullish fib from low to high, prices and discount, and if you use this high to this low, yes, price got the premium and it's pushing on lower, but at this point in time, price is actually still in discount. So you're actually in a um, disadvantaged position either way, and you probably should not be looking too short at any time while you're in discount. We'll be looking for. Then below stops. Number sell stops below and below. We don't see some of that happening here. Doesn't need to do that. It's only turning down this down candle. It's a bullish order. A down candle before the market was higher. That's where the market support really lies. Um, where it lies resides in. Okay. Uh, up candles before the market drops down. Uh, up candles is exactly where resistance is in situations. So for selling curves. So when we see price action, we can define things in terms of fair value in relationship to how the market is going to perceive price. The way they value price in terms of the current range that's trading in, the same way they value the lower price. Where are we at in proximity to the current range? We have a nice impulsive price action high to low here. We're in the lower portion of that range here. We have built-in buy stops below this high, below this high here, below this high here, and a valuation gap. Okay, valuation gap. Markets don't want to come back up there because it's very low time in this area. There's all down movement, all down movement. No, no buying is actually occurring here. No buying is occurring here. It's all in the sell side, all in the flow. So market ran up into just We're only selling the place and no buyers. So now, when price comes back up to that level, make sure you're up there like that. That's going to make a run on the stop below some high, and we're going to close the range between the top candle and the top candle here, which is a fair value gap. So when we're looking at price action, it's a couple things in consideration. The total range trading, the equilibrium price point relative to the most recent trading range, high and low, and we define several of them here. We get this high to this low, we get this high and this low, and this high and this low. So we have multiple things lining up with the fact that for fair value's sake, the market is a deep discount here, and it's most likely going to trade higher. And we have reference points we can look for the market to aim, but ultimately, this is the fair value gap that they want to get back into. And the reason why the basis was, we call it 765, but we just below where I'm going to go in the lower which is high. I'm looking at 70, 75, I'm going to be about 10 tips or so before the actual level is actually going to be hit or the end of the slope before that. And one more instance of the things I've talked about before happening in the charts and why those things actually are materializing in price action. So price return back to fair value, fair value in the market meter, not fair value in the scope of buying it. This is a premium. Okay, remember that market is fair value, I started to all that. How you perceive marketplace is not how retail is going to see price. So they're going to see this as market is going to keep going up, doesn't keep going up. Well, this is an area distribution. You want to be thinking accumulation down here, reaccumulation, distribution. Scaling out all through the areas in here. Because you don't know if it's going to come down to that range, so you're going to change the way you don't know if it's going to go lower. So when you buy things down here at the discount, you have to scale some of it out. But the beginning basis points of valuation in terms of market makers, you have to look at the range, look at the market move away from quickly in the areas of liquidity voids and liquidity uh, uh, pools. So the ties, here and here and here. If that is going to be fair value for the market to distribute long positions. If we're looking at sell position or short position, we would be looking for areas in which the market in the past has moved up a great deal of speed. And we would be looking for lows where stops would be building up a little bit of the normal sell stops. We would look for the lower end of the most recent range for valuation. So that way you know by looking at things that the market is going to You're not looking at things like retail. You're looking at things like, okay, I'm the bank. I'm, I'm making the book here. Where's the most efficient price level for me to unload my longs or unload my short positions? We've already mentioned it so far in the teachings of September. The easiest way to understand this short flow from the beginning, starting point of all, is understanding that markets move from Buy stops and sell stops and sell stops and sell stops and it moves from fair value to discount to discount to premium to premium to fair value. It moves back and forth between three reference points. Are we at discount? Are we at premium? Are we at fair value? All these things combined together, they give you the clues as to what we're seeing in terms of market makers. Uh, action. Are they accumulating? Are they manipulating? Are they distributing? All these factors, we're going to bring these closely knit ideas into a more easily understood premise. When we look at price, we're going to see these things unfolding in, in advance. And we're going to see what should take place. And it's very encouraging to see your study and individual components start to flesh out and have a great understanding of price action. So, in closing, fair value is not fair value in the realm of retail. It's in the realm of fair value of liquidating or accumulating. Did you know that Amazon has a 15 million dollar fund that they have to pay out every month? Here's how you can get that from it. Fair value in discount is fair value for buys from market buying. Fair value in premium is fair value for market selling. Either selling new shorts or exiting on scaling out long positions. Discount, the low equilibrium, in the lower end of the range, that's discount market, that's an area based on market buying or look to cover the short positions. Do not look at marketplace in this retail mindset. We're all trying to do what we have seen. Well, we're from. It's the same dirty stuff, but it's wrong. Can understand how these markets are delivered to us in the form of price action. When this price is delivered to us, it's not random. It's very specific. We're going to get why we want to get there. That's what we're giving you in this membership. It's very specific, detailed perspectives that are generic. They repeat themselves over and over again, and because they repeat themselves, because of the same phenomenon, they take place on a daily basis. There's nothing for you to fear. If you mess it up and you don't get trade the payment right, you miss a move. Do not worry about it. Wait for the market indications of where fair valuation is. Then we'll be able to anticipate the market makers next scaling or scale out. It may be the location of the long position in the way. That may give you a prognostication for future move. It may be the inception of a new price like while you're waiting for this area to be retreated. We'll build on this idea for now. I'm just thinking in terms of where we at relative to the current range. Are we lower end? Are we near the low of that current range? And are we working around the equilibrium, equilibrium price point between that recent high and low? By finding price in current trading ranges like this, you'll be able to see where the market will stand in price. So next expansion, you know, prior to expansion, it's been what? Consolidation. So as you study more examples of the market for consolidation, you'll be able to forecast the next movement out of consolidation. We don't, we don't play the breakout game. We anticipate the breakout. We know that the indications through price action will give us clues as to what's our market's going to break out. And when we get the commodities, we'll have actually uh, a great advantage of that value to the forex. You don't get so much. You can still see it in the future. So I'm going to close this te
basically uh, trying to keep open one, one chart to keep it on. So you examples of it, you can see it uh, called for in advance. I'll give you this week. Not so much why um, in this great detail, but I'll give you the areas of which price should reach for. We talked about there here. We talked about this here. I'm not obviously going to talk about the high because we haven't seen that last time. Think in terms of fair value for market maker. If they're going to go higher, where's the fair value for them to exit their loans? Okay, so if it's a fair value for them to do so. They do not want to liquidate loans at a discount or when retracement is going lower. You look for expansions on the upside. When they expand, when the market expands, they should be reaching to an area fair value for price to be liquidating smart money loans. That's the only reason why the market's go up. That's the only reason why prices are allowed to be delivered at high prices. Because the market makers, the banks, have books, own their books there are net long. And it's in their interest to keep the price higher. It doesn't matter how many of us buy, the price is going to be set by the bank. And there are things to learn from pockets and not yours. So it takes a perspective shift and it gets back to that market that you can't really start to do that. And it's an important shift. You have to do things from a smart money's perspective, not what retail should be doing. For what retail is doing. If you do that, you're going to miss the actual clarity that comes through looking at and by contrasting that with what you see in the charts for fair value, liquidity gaps, liquidity voids, liquidity pools, all these things, the market's going to seek that liquidity and run against the less informed crowd's opinion. So that much. One thing I'll have to do and go back, I'll definitely put in the notes and correct it tomorrow. But when he says price returns to fair value, I'm actually starting to think he's not talking about fair value gaps. He's just talking about fair value as in the banks are not going to want to short down here in discount. They have more objectives of pushing price on up to get to premium. They also have objectives of closing in on these fair value gaps or liquidity voids here and that in it of itself or also to closing in on this void up here as well and that in it of itself is price returning to fair value but i'll go back and review that on my own time right now and i will put that in the notes and correct that for tomorrow but let's go ahead and continue we have two more videos to go through today Look at first to the degree to which market or asset security can quickly bar sold in the market without affecting the asset price dramatically. When we look at price, it doesn't matter what time frame you're looking at. Time is irrelevant for right now. The specifics about price action as it relates to liquidity. We as price action traders will look specifically for reference points where you can hone in on where there is a high probability of liquidity resting in the marketplace. Now, liquidity, as it relates to IT concepts, it relates to buyers and sellers. It's as simple as that. But when we have a swing in the marketplace, as you know here, and the market trades lower, our understanding is that there was someone that went short here. This position would be net positive or profitable as the market moves lower. As the market turns around, if the same positions were still held, their open profits would be eroding. And at some point, at this point right here, it would be a losing position. Our understanding is that there's a short position for traders that are there in the marketplace. If they have positioned a profitable trade here and moved lower, their stop loss would be resting right above this high, or generally in just right at that high. The market tends to find an interesting going back to where that large body of interest, or what we call liquidity in the marketplace, it would be by liquidity. As the market finds these lows down here, as the market rises away, our understanding is that there's only buyers that have positions that are net positive or profitable as it trades higher. At some point, when the market starts to trade back down lower, back into the area in which the buyers would originate from, their open profits would be eroding. And so eventually, moving into this area here, it would be a net loss position. So when we, look at, when we look at price, the idea is we're not looking for specific patterns, specific patterns. We're looking at where existing orders will reside. So essentially what we do is just targeting areas at which the market has already seen a willingness to go higher or lower. In this case, we see a swing high and the market moves lower. We view that as a smart money trader or as a market maker perspective. We know there's going to be buy stop or buy liquidity above the high. When we look at the lows, when the market moves away from these lows, we see that as sell liquidity. Identifying both of these positions on both sides of the marketplace, we're going to teach a concept called open float. While that's not going to be covered in this specific tutorial for this month of training, it's important to understand the beginning foundations to understand liquidity as it relates to buying and selling the marketplace. Our first fundamental understanding is that there's going to be liquidity above old highs and below old lows. When we understand that, we can see that they will eventually target these same levels, moving price just above a previous high, knocking out the liquidity, will be resting just above the size and form of buy stops. Below old lows, the market will seek liquidity for the sell side or the sell stops, taking the orders out. To understand this premise, when we view price action, it removes all of the retail-minded perspective, but heavily leaning on indicator-based ideas. When we adopt these principles with study of price, it gives us the most truest, purest view of how price is delivered. We have no confidence or direct relationship to our directional bias on price relative to anything except for price itself. If the market moves from old high, we know that there's going to be liquidity resting above that old high. If the market moves from old low, we know there's going to be resting below those lows. It's just that simple. Now there's another concept. If the market moves from old high, we know. Yeah, so that was pretty simple. But to even try to simplify it even more, when you are trading, when you see a swing high or a swing low. We need to look at these areas as levels of liquidity or areas of liquidity. And what I mean by this, if you have a swing high and price pushes away, you can look at it two different ways. One, there is going to be stop losses above this high as traders are looking to short or already in short positions. Also, if you drag maybe a resistance line here or some type of supply zone, think about all the traders that are going to short from here. They see price fell on lower from here. So they anticipate when price comes back here, supposedly it should fall lower once again. If they anticipate price to fall lower, they're going to have their stop loss above this high. In a short position, a stop loss is going to be a buy stop. So this is what ICT is saying. There are buy orders or buy stops resting above this high. And the banks look to target this liquidity by triggering these buy stops and then reversing the opposite direction. Same thing down here whether a trader is currently in a buy position and they have their stop loss down here, or a trader is using this as a support level or a demand zone and looking too long from here, when they place their long, their stop loss will be underneath these lows. And in a long position, a stop loss is going to be a sell stop. 
And so the banks are looking to target those sell stops. So that's all the liquidity is. It is the buy stops above highs and the sell stops below lows. Now there's another concept when we understand liquidity. The market has a tendency to run out old highs and old lows, but it has a very difficult time to do that when the market has conditions like this. When the market moves higher, and they generally tend to move higher and then it moves lower here. Now, in the context of this entire move lower, there's a lot of peaks and troughs here. A lot of peaks and troughs. The, the idea is that this is an old high back here. For this high to be ran out, okay, or to see the liquidity resting above that old high, if this is where current market action is right now, or current price, at market price. For it to get all the way up there, it has to encounter a lot of resistance in the form of old lows and old highs. So you have the old lows acting as standard resistance, then you have the old highs acting as buy stop liquidity. So even if the market's going to go up, if the market's going to see liquidity above this high, how do we know it's going to stop there? It can go another level higher for these buy stops, and it can be short this level of buy stops, and then we need this buy stop level here. In the direction to run all these buy stops, it's got to go through a lot of resistance in the form of these old lows just to get back up to this old high. When the market presents these opportunities, and again, this is not specific to any time it's universal, but when we see the market give this, this very thick area of resistance, okay, there's a lot of price action that the market has to trade through to get back to an old high significance, we view this as a high resistance liquidity run. The market's going to have a very hard time getting through all these previous lows and previous highs just to run out the liquidity that we're resting above this old high. When we trade, we're not looking for these opportunities. While there are opportunities to trade with this in mind in other later teachings, it's important to understand that this is the least probable trading condition to look for longs because you have so many levels of resistance and old highs to encounter before you get back to the old significant high. We understand that the market has been presenting lower lows and lower highs, and somebody in this market is obviously being profitable. Those individuals who stops above this old high in the form of fund, they're actually very highly defended because of this type of price action. So it's going to take a very uh, sharp economic market release that they have to come down from That's going to knock through all of these levels of resistance to run out the liquidity. But generally, without that type of influence or injection of volatility, the old highs generally are well defended. Obviously, the opposite can be said when we see the market make a low some time, it could be able to take a long time to really perform this. Uh, but the old low, we obviously have sell stops below or sell liquidity. And as the market makes higher highs and higher lows, if we're seeing price action right here, we can't reasonably expect the market to drop straight down and make a run on the sell stops below this low without encountering first all of these higher lows and higher highs as the market went higher. So to get through each one of these highs, okay, there's going to be a lot of resistance to just run down out the stops that will be resting below this low. Again, just like we just mentioned with the high resistance liquidity run for old highs, the same is true here for high resistance liquidity runs on an old low. It's going to be very difficult for price to reach down through all of this price action. And the more time. It so here he's classifying the highs as resistance. I'm not too sure exactly why he's calling them resistance. Same thing with the opposite scenario. He was calling the lows, I believe, yeah, resistance as well. So hopefully soon I will get clarification on that and maybe understand that a bit more. But right now I'm not too sure what he means by that. I'm extending this area again more unlikely is the market move all the way down this whole Despite the fact that there may be really high levels of liquidity pressing below that low, without the evidence of a significant market driver coming into play with like an FOMC interest rate announcement or non-farm payroll or something that would be completely unexpected in the marketplace, blacks, and like that, that's generally the only type of thing you see that would cut through this type of price action to get to the sell side of the liquidity here. So for short, we avoid these types of occurrences. There are opportunities that we'll learn with trading with this profile or this market condition for high resistance liquidity runs, but for now, we want to understand that this is the element of price action that we want to trade very less frequently in. Now, obviously, uh, there's going to be times when the market really provides us uh, an opportunistic time to take action in the market and trade with price action and have very low resistance in our trades. And obviously, that comes by way of trading in low resistance liquidity runs. A low resistance liquidity run would be in the form of something similar to this. Now, these crude depictions, while they are relatively in the way they're being shown here, the concept is very easy to see in price action as we'll look at when we look at the actual crude diagrams I shared here. If we see the market come up a whole high, okay, and it comes down rather quickly, if there is a very sharp or one way type direction, very little uh, retracements of any kind, we see this, okay, once that market breaks below an old low, from that point, it breaks a low until it gets through a short term high. In other words, the market comes down, makes a low here, starts to trade off, comes down, makes a higher low. Once it starts running through, if we get a market breakthrough this short term high, this run here begins its climb back up into the range that's created by this low being broken, so it's being defined by this level here, all the way down to this high. Once it's broken, this area of the price action is deemed low resistance. Now, every time that a new short term high is formed, before this low is retreated to or retested as resistance, every time there's a new short term high, we're going to form above that short term high. It's going to have buy stop liquidity. So, buy side liquidity is going to be above the old highs. If we get a buy signal after a retracement, we know there's going to be very little resistance for that move to go higher, running out the buy stops just above these short term highs. As we get closer to coming up into hitting this low that's been violated here, we then we start encountering high resistance liquidity runs. So, the probabilities fall off precipitously once we get back to the area where the range is defined in terms of low resistance, and then it becomes a high resistance liquidity run. To make any higher highs or run on higher highs, it becomes a lot more resistance to do that because we move back to an area where the market is in the range. This expansion, okay, that's the easiest part of trading when we trade inside that range. So, every time we create a short term high in here, if you get a buy signal, that buy signal will have very little resistance to get through the old high that we chase from, and you continuously look for those until you fill in that break on this old low. Once it gets back to this old low over here, the market goes into what we refer to as a high resistance liquidity run. Anything higher than this price point here becomes a high resistance liquidity run. We must everything else always talk. Everything I teach one side that obviously is communicated by using the uh, reverse or just turning upside down. Uh, this is a sell side of the marketplace, low resistance liquidity run. Uh, we have a consolidation here. The market expands, there's no expansion. It breaks above a short term high. So at the moment the short term high is broken here, market starts bullish. And then we go into a real quick run up. The market will create a high, starts to break down. And once the market starts trading below and below, the market will have a very easy time trading back down into the point which the short term high is broken on the outside. So all this one way direction price action, where all the books is one side from buy only, very low retracements, this is the easiest time trading in the marketplace right in here. It's defined by the short term high that's broken on the outside here. That's where you begin your point, which is deemed a low resistance liquidity run. So you're focusing primarily on selling short. Every retracement is going to find very low resistance going lower to run out the previous low. There's going to be resting below these lows. Sell stop liquidity. So the market goes lower, breaks below the short term low here, expands, has smaller retracement, which only form below the short term low. Bottom chasers, folks are going to be long. But we understand that the market has broken an old high here and had real quick sudden price action, very low retracements. So again, very low resistance on the downside, getting back to that point which market structure broke. So between this point here and where the market breaks down this low here, this is the easiest area to trade in price action because you have very low resistance allowing price to cut through all that. But you're waiting for a short term low form. Every time a short term low forms, there's going to be self liquidity resting below those lows. Let's take a look at more examples of a high resistance. So if you didn't catch that for the examples, our very first one is going to be high resistance due to the fact of all the little highs and lows in price action. For example, here, as price pushes on lower, you have a lot of internal highs and lows as price pushes on lower. But in the other example, I believe it is
So if you have a clean bullish or bearish push, most likely you're going to encounter low resistance and liquidity. But if that push is going to be a bit choppy, such as this example or this example, it is going to be a high resistance liquidity. Short term low form, every short term low forms, there's going to be self-stop liquidity, resting below those lows. Let's take a look at more examples of a high resistance liquidity run and a low resistance liquidity run. And let me say this, uh, two types of liquidity runs are different. We have a whole high back here, noted here. And market starts to move lower, and we showed this example of price action here, this old high, violin this old high here, selling off these old lows being violin here, and market starts to rally up. Notice there's very little resistance in the marketplace when this high eventually trading lower, taking out the liquidity resting below these lows here. This run from this high, taking out these lows, is referred to as a low resistance liquidity run, because we have a longer term high to the left of us, and the market has shown a willingness to take out a low, and we came back above, cleared out stop, above the high, retraced, had an unwillingness to go above, this up candle here, so institutional workflow, as you learn more about throughout this entire mentorship, moves back to bearish, and expands to the downside, expands down to the downside, to run out these stop low, these lows. The market rallies up again, and fails to get above this one high. This run higher is a high resistance liquidity run. The fact that it's going to have a very difficult time being above this high is because we've already priced in a longer term high, a near term high, and this high is going to have a very hard time struggling to get through this high. It's going to have a very difficult time to through. So this rally up through buying long here, we know that there's going to be high probability that this higher is a high resistance liquidity run. The fact that it's going to have a very difficult time being above this high is because we've already priced in a long term high, a near term high, and this high is going to have a very hard time struggling to get through this high. It's going to have a very difficult time to through. So this rally up through buying long here, we know that there's going to be high probability that this is not going to be running out. The high is going to be intact and defended, and the higher high here will be defended. So when price goes back up into this high, this actually becomes a low resistance liquidity run to see price come all the way down to take out this low here. The fact that we keep this old high in place, and every low that forms has very little resistance as each time it goes through, it's like a hot knife through butter. Very little resistance. Now, every time a low form, price goes through those lows. This equal lows here, price trades through those. This short term low here, price trades through those. These short term lows here, price trades through those. So the bias is bearish. So you want to focus primarily on a market rally to take out short term lows or any term lows. The difference between that is every rally is going to be viewed as a high resistance liquidity run. It's going to have a very difficult time getting above the previous highs. Sometimes it will happen, but generally you'll find it's going to have a very difficult time doing that. But because that's built into price action, having a high resistance liquidity run here, it turns into a low resistance liquidity run for you to see a move below the short term lows. Every short term low is an opportunity to see liquidity or the market to stand down after retracing up to take out the stops that rest below the market at every old low. Every single low that you see in price, once you identify where the market is in terms of high resistance or low resistance liquidity, we can find old lows to the left, market respects it here, comes back with a low liquidity, resting below this low here, and this low here, and the market runs right through it, solid retracement, there's more liquidity below this low here, so it's going to stand down through it. So we have old lows back here, so we're going to do what? It's going to retrace a little bit, and then do what? Expand down, take out those stops below this old low here. The same thing is seen when the market finds a low market. The market creates a small consolidation, makes it a long term low, rallies up, retraces, moves into consolidation, rallies to again, so now we have a lot of price action here, so this old low is going to be well defended. The fact that we have retracement going lower each time, every time the market retraces, that's going to be in the form of a high resistance liquidity run. It's going to find very stiff resistance with violating old lows. The old lows are going to be actually defended, and you're going to see buying from the marketplace. Your focus is going to be primarily on the highs. Every short-term high is going to have a very easy run through them. That forms a low resistance liquidity run. The resistance levels are going to be very weak. The support or lows are going to be very strong because the market is going to capitalize only on the buy side. Just reverse what we saw right here. On the sell side, everything's going to be supporting bearish prices. So every trade is higher, sets up another price like to go lower. Aim for the lows to be violated. We change the high here and we get a low. So every time the market is lower, it sets up new buying opportunities to take out the short-term highs or the near-term highs above the marketplace. Because we're going to rest above those highs. Buy stops. And you want to be buying low and selling to buy buyers above the current market action. And that's what the market makers do. So every time the market trades down, it's actually just a new low resistance liquidity run to make it run above the low high. And it makes it very easy to find trades this way. Market trades down, small retracement, it's old high, will be easy to run out. Low resistance liquidity run. Market trades back, and it has retracement. Very little resistance to get back up to this old high, it runs cleanly through that. Another retracement here, we'll quickly rest above this old high. And then the market stands through it as well. And then the market trades through those lows as well. Because there's many elements of the things I've saw in this month's teaching, looking for clean highs where levels are just too clean. Uh, when the market shows those types of levels, it's going to be very uh, opportunistic for you to build the idea that there's a buy stop above that. So any low retracement, set the turn from the drive through that, and the market continues to find ease of getting back through old highs. At some point, you're going to look at price action, and it's going to be very crystal clear that the more price action there is around a specific level, or a higher or low, that is indicating a level being defended on an institutional price model. So you're going to see very easy trading when you trade away from that level. And by doing that, you're going to gain yourself in sync with the institutional level. Then you're trading. I might need to re-watch this one to get a better understanding exactly what he's trying to say. But my interpretation here is, obviously, as price is going bearish here, and obviously, since price is going bearish, it is intended to make new lows and not intended to make new highs. So price is truly going bearish, of course, as it's making new lows. Price is, you can, I guess you can, you can consider these as low resistance liquidity areas because price is intending it is supposed to be making new lows and since price is not intended to make new highs the highs can be high resistance liquidity areas so as price is going bearish it's just simply if price is bearish anticipate price to make new lows don't anticipate the lows to be protected anticipate the highs to be protected and then as price reverses to go bullish if it is bullish anticipate the lows to be protected and don't anticipate the highs to be protected. In bullish structure or just a bullish market, you anticipate price to make higher highs and higher lows. So in this case, you anticipate this high to get ran, but you anticipate the lows to get protected, and so on and so forth. Creates a small consolidation, makes it a long-term low, rallies up, reach a level or a higher low. When you trade away from that level, and by doing that, you're getting yourself in sync with the institutional workflow. Then your trades will find very low resistance in the form of profitable exits and very low drawdown. That's what we're looking at impulse price swings and market protection. Very similar ideas, but uniquely different. Um, I'm going to first talk about impulse price swings. A impulse price swing would be something like this. Okay, so you have an impulse price swing down, then we have another impulse price swing higher, and then another impulse price swing lower, and another impulse swing higher, followed by impulse swing lower, and higher swing of impulse movement higher, 
Another impulse swing lower, followed by another impulse swing higher, followed by impulse swing lower, another impulse swing higher, and ultimately another impulse swing lower. So you have price swings moving from high down to low, to high down to low, to high to low, to high, making a low, up to high down to low, up to high down to low. You look at price action, you need to be thinking in terms of impulse price swings, because inside impulse price swings is going to give you a lot of detail. Now, there are smaller, more specific impulse price swings that have a lot more influence over the marketplace in the form of a manipulative move or market making manipulation. So let's take all this off and focus primarily on protraction now. If you look at the market with the similar ideas we just illustrated with every impulsive price swing, and then we add to it time of day. By holding down control and tapping Y on your keyboard, you'll add the vertical delineations for zero DMT. So zero DMT, vertical line to the day divide basically. When we see this, okay, then we can look at time sensitive impulse price swings, which is market protraction. Market protraction is time sensitive. It's an impulse price swing that is highly sensitive to a time of day. There are three primary protractionary market moves every 24 hours. The first one is rate at zero DMT. You'll see mono movement away or lower and lower or down. We get that, that delineation in time. Now you see one here, it trades down and moves higher. We see this one here, it trades down and moves higher. We see this one here, it trades higher. This one here, it trades higher. And that's all we're looking for, for that age session. I don't believe just that influential initially. Um, the other market protectionary state is in is in London. Now we can take the control Y feature off and just focus on the vertical lines here, the Midnight New York. Initially, we have to Midnight New York. I'm going to say we have a market move higher. This market move here is a protectionary market phase. When the market trades up initially, at a specific time phase, there's an impulse pricing here. The design is to fake out the individuals that chase that initial move after midnight. The second impulsive pricing starts in New York. We only need 7 o'clock in the morning. And we anticipate if the market has moved lower in London, we're going to be looking for a retracement higher. That impulsive price move higher is market protection. It's designed and intended for manipulation only. It's to get traders to think that the market's making low in this case. It rises up and trades down alternately. Here again, here's New York time. In New York session opening, the market goes into a protectionary Going into New York open. Smaller retracement, the market trades lower. Again, 7 o'clock in the morning, the market goes into a small impulse pricing, higher. This is market protraction. Its intent is from manipulation. It's counter direction. In other words, if this move occurs at this time of day, if it goes higher, we think the opposite direction. If it goes lower, we think the opposite direction. So if it initially moves higher, and the market is going lower, we see that as manipulation or market protraction. Market will seek to draw input into the long term market or reach liquidity. It has to happen at 7 o'clock in the morning. It has to happen at 7 o'clock in the morning. It has to happen at 7 o'clock in the morning. The other one is in the London session, obviously. And it's after 4 GMT on the 4 LTD demo account. If we see it moving higher and reverse, we see that as market protraction or a geo swing. It's a false rally to sell into. Same thing occurs in after New York's 7 o'clock in the morning time. We anticipate a round up. Off the London high, so we see that we expect the market to go into a protractionary state where it rises up to reach liquidity and there's down. This day here, market drops initially, break right from the midnight candle, drops lower, then rallies up. So this is market protraction, it seeks liquidity below the market through here, from the lows, and then rallies. Trade New York, market's moment final rally here, and then sells off. The next day, London, we see initial rally after midnight candle, and then it trades lower. Right after the New York, we have more protractionary state marketplace, so the market rallies again. Small minor impulse price swing that's designed is to manipulate the sentiment and or the thoughts of traders wanting to be participants. This will go low, and this one up here with entice buyers in the New York session and the university. Having these things in mind, we can look at market in the context of what we shared so far this month. We see a market move down from a market impulse price swing. So we can measure that swing down. From the high, we can use this one. This high comes this low, it retraces back up above equilibrium, so we go into a premium market at 62 percent level. We can sell there, there's a move, expectancy around below this low. Market is in a protractionary phase after impulse price swing. We can be a seller, reach equilibrium below the lows, and looking over here in previous days, we can find an old move back here as well, and market trades down into that level. Market makes a little impulse price swing here. In this context, market rises up, we'll uh, move higher. In the next London session, it's a juice swing lower, or market protectionary phase. Faking trades out, things are dropping initially, and rise up, and rise up into the New York session. Right into a premium market. So we're blending impulse price swings, and then time day. We trade right back into equilibrium for market protection, right here, and then it stands on lower. Taking out stops below the lows right here, and aiming for stops below these equal lows. So it's taking right here. No impulse price swing, here. Down to the low, right here. Impulse swing up, right at the New York minimum candle. Juice swing higher, fake move higher, it trades down. Going into New York, we see a protraction market phase where it trades up, right into an area where it's sold off before. Lower expansion, reaching out into the 32 level. And why are we down here, and why is it quickly moving so fast to be on that level? It's because you see the old over here. The difference in, the, in determining Impulse price swings and market protraction is the fact that there is a time element applied to the small impulse swing after midnight, New York time, after 7 a.m., New York time, and 8 p.m., New York time. There's usually a protraction market phase in the marketplace, and it's a small impulse price swing that's counter the major direction you're going to see after that specific time of day. So, for session trading and for session drills, you can use this concept to help give you context in your practicing and also build your anticipatory price skills. <clears throat> so, at first, I was going to critique how he is drawing these impulse swing moves because it can be quite subjective. Um, like for example, in the very beginning, I was trying to figure out why he wasn't going to use this impulse move right here. He's forgetting about this quick low. But as he stated, not only are we just finding these impulse swing moves, we're also adding that element of time. I will go back and watch to see if he does give any specific time frames, which I think he does. But if we add the element of time and the impulse move during that time, this is how we can find the significant ranges that we should be plotting and trying to short or long, or at least anticipate price to get into premium if price is going bearish, or anticipate price to get into discount if we are looking to go long. But other than that, this is the end of day two. I thank you guys for watching. If you guys did enjoy this video, please leave a like, leave a comment down below if you guys have any suggestions. And don't forget, I do have a free Discord if you guys do want to join it for absolutely free. Click that link in the bio. 
Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you guys tomorrow.